Today we welcome Michael Mukasey back to the committee for his second appearance as Attorney General. Uh, the Attorney General has been on the job for eight months in succeeding Alberto Gonzalez. He's now more than halfway through his term as Attorney General. And as I've told him privately and publicly, his tenure is going to be judged by how much he's done to restore the Department of Justice, an agency, I believe, whose mission objectives were severely undercut by scandals under the Bush administration. Attorney General will also be judged by what the Department has done and not done to reaffirm the checks and balances that are the fulcrum of our democracy and a key to protecting the rights and liberties of all Americans. When this committee began its oversight efforts at the start of this Congress, we exposed a crisis of leadership and partisan political influence that had taken a heavy toll on the well-deserved tradition of independence that has long guided the United States Department of Justice. And senators on this committee from both sides of the aisle joined together to press for accountability. What followed was a change in leadership of the department with the resignations of Attorney General Gonzalez, the Deputy Attorney General, the Associate Attorney General, their Chiefs of Staff, the White House Liaison, and the resignations of Karl Rove, his political deputies, the White House Counsel, and others. We've seen what happens when the rule of law plays second fiddle to a President's agenda and the partisan desires of political operatives. It becomes a disaster for the American people. Both the President and the nation are best served by a Justice Department that provides sound advice and takes responsible action, not one that develops legalistic loopholes and ideological litmus tests to serve the ends of a particular administration, whether it's a Democratic administration or a Republican administration. And the recent report from the Department's Inspector General confirmed what our oversight efforts have uncovered about the politicization of hiring practices at the Department. It confirms our findings and our fears that the same Bush Justice Department officials involved with the firing of United States attorneys were injecting partisanship into the hiring of young attorneys. I expect further reports from the Inspector General will shed additional light on the extent to which the Bush administration has allowed politics to affect and infect the Department's priorities from law enforcement to the operation of the Civil Rights Division to the Department's hiring practices. So I've said many times, and I've said this with six administrations since I've been here, the Department of Justice is not the President's legal defense team any more than the Attorney General is his lawyer. The Attorney General is not the White House counsel and should not act as one. The Department of Justice is a law enforcement agency, not a partisan political operation. The Attorney General is the Attorney General of the United States, not the Attorney General of the President or anything else. He's the Attorney General of the United States, all of us. And these are truths that have been overridden in the last seven years. So this hearing is for the Attorney General to show us what he's done on each of these fronts. For example, what has he done to restore the independence of the Department of Justice? What he's done to push back against the overreaching from the Bush-Cheney White House, including its claims to unfettered power at the expense of the principles of judicial review and congressional oversight. On issue after issue, from the warrantless wiretapping of American citizens to the sent into torture thinly veiled by the use of the Orwellian term enhanced interrogation techniques from undercutting laws meant to protect clean air and clean water, the untoward political influence of the White House as the nation's top law enforcement agency, from the destruction of CIA tapes showing detainee interrogations, the grandiose claims of immunity and executive privilege from congressional oversight makes the Watergate era look like child's play. The conservative Supreme Court's recent decision in Bomindien versus Bush reaffirmed our core American values. It's a stinging rebuke to the Bush administration's excesses. They said uh, security subsists too in fidelity to freedom's first principles. Among them are the freedom from arbitrary and unlawful restraint. These 
principles of checks and balances, the rule of law, are what this administration and the previously complicit Justice Department have ignored. There are fundamental adherence to our Constitution and the rule of law is a strain. And no one, not even the President, is above the law. The Justice Department owes loyalty to the law. Um, now the Attorney General repeatedly assured us during his confirmation hearing they'd take a fresh look at the secret memos. He committed to this committee they would review them. These were the secret legal memorandum that have sought to define torture down to meaningless and to excuse warrantless spying and justify absolute immunity of White House employees from congressional subpoenas without reference to a single legal, a single legal precedent. The Attorney General committed to this committee that he would review them and withdraw or modify those who were unjustified or unwise. Even Attorney General Gonzalez did that. He withdrew the August 2001 Bybee memo justifying torture when it came to light, coincidentally, just before his confirmation hearing in 2005. So we look forward to finally to obtaining these memos, obtaining even the index of these memoranda that we've been denied for years. Today, we look forward to learning which aspects of uh, what memos that formed the legal framework for the Bush administration policies have been modified or withdrawn by the Attorney General. This committee has a, a special stewardship role to protect our most cherished rights and liberties as Americans and to make sure that our fundamental freedoms are preserved for future generations. I believe in the past seven and a half years, we've taken a path that's disregarded basic rights and turned us from a nation devoted to the rule of law to one ruled by secret pronouncements of the executive. I'll put my full statement on the record and yield to Senator Specter. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I joined the chairman in welcoming you here, Attorney General Casey, and in noting the significant improvements in the Department of Justice since you have uh, taken over. Uh, we are considering on the Senate floor today the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and uh, it is an opportunity for Congress to finally assert some authority and try to move for separation of powers to try to check the uh, unparalleled expansion of executive authority which we've noticed since 9-11. I believe that historians will look back at this period as the greatest expansion of executive authority uh, that has gone unchecked uh, by Congress uh, and significantly unchecked by the uh, by the courts. Uh, we have had uh, a challenge to the constitutionality of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. The Detroit Federal Court held it unconstitutional. Sixth Circuit reversed on standing grounds in a two-to-one decision, and the Supreme Court, uh, in effect, ducked the case, denied certiorari when there were ample grounds to take it up, as uh, noted in the very a persuasive dissenting opinion uh, on standing. And now the Congress is being asked to strip the federal courts of some 40 cases which are pending uh, for determination of the constitutional rights of uh, people who have been uh, allegedly uh, wiretapped by the telephone companies without, uh, uh, without court order. Uh, as I've argued on the floor, and I have an amendment pending, it is especially unfortunate because we could keep both the, the surveillance program and have judicial review if we substituted the government as the party defending. But the Attorney General has a significant role to play in this overall uh, issue in terms of advice to the President. Uh, I was very much impressed when you said in your confirmation hearing that if the president did not follow your advice on constitutional issues, that the matter of resignation would be foremost in your mind. Uh, the president violated the National Security Act of 1947 uh, in not notifying the intelligence committees of the terrorist surveillance program, a firm statutory duty. He could have used some good advice on that point. 
Uh, he did not notify the chairman or ranking member of the Judiciary Committee. Long-standing protocol. Uh, I was chairman at the time and arguing for the Patriot Act uh, on a Friday in mid-June of 2005 when the New York Times story dominated all of the substantive arguments and uh, we could not get the act passed. Senators said that uh, had they known about this terrorist surveillance program, uh, they wouldn't have been for the, the bill. So that there are very important issues on uh, uh, separation of powers. Uh, a number of matters that uh, uh, I will be discussing with you during the uh, question and answer session, as I told you in our telephone conversation earlier this week, uh, the matter of the attorney-client privilege uh, is uh, uh, very, very significant. Uh, I have a bill pending which would uh, change uh, what the Department of Justice is doing uh, because of two very fundamental uh, constitutional privileges. Well, one is the attorney-client privilege, which necessarily involves confidentiality, and the second is the uh, burden of the Commonwealth of the state to prove its case. Uh, when I uh, was a prosecutor, I wouldn't have thought of asking someone to waive their privilege, and yet that is being done here. And it may be in the corporation's interest to waive the privilege to have a reduction in charges or a reduction on sentencing, uh, but there are individuals who have that privilege within the corporation uh, who ought not to be uh, coerced into waiving the privilege. And uh, let me say to you candidly, uh, Mr. Attorney General, that the discussions have gone on too long. The Thompson memo, the McNulty memo, now uh, the Deputy Attorney General is preparing a new memo. I talked to him. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, it is vague as to when it is to be completed, and I hope uh, uh, that the chairman will uh, uh, bring this matter before the committee so we can move ahead on the legislative channel. Uh, similarly, uh, we need to bring the discussions to a head on reporters' privilege. Uh, we find that there is a decisive chilling effect on newspaper reporters across the country uh, for what happened uh, with Judith Miller and what is happening with uh, other reporters. Still an enigma to me as to why she spent 85 days in jail. It wasn't a very pleasant uh, stay she had there, I know, because I visited her in the summer of 2005. Uh, why was she uh, held in contempt when we knew the Deputy Secretary of State Armitage was the source of the leaks? That still hasn't been answered. but. Rather than looking backward, I think we need to look forward and to see to it that uh, there's an appropriate balance. And the legislation has national security exceptions. And if there are other matters which need to be resolved, let's sit down and try to get them worked out. Because uh, uh, in our society, we don't have to talk about the importance of the media. And Jefferson's statement still rings true if he had to choose between government without newspapers or newspapers without government, he'd uh, choose the newspapers. It may be a close call these days, but, uh, uh, but I still the newspapers are still in the lead, considering what's happening uh, with the expansion of executive authority. Uh, one, uh, one final point, uh, and that is uh, on a matter uh, that I raised with the uh, uh, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation about a leak in the case involving Congressman Kurt Weldon, which occurred a few days before the 2006 election, which was the direct defeat of a very distinguished congressman who'd held office for some 20 years. They had a search and seizure on his daughter's home, and uh, there was a leak. The newspaper reporters were there uh, in advance. Uh, and I asked uh, uh, Director Mueller uh, about that uh, back in December of 2006 and uh, uh, didn't get an answer. And it was buried in the FBI's written responses to written questions. Well, there's a difference when there's a question posed in a hearing by a senator than when it's staff work and written questions. Uh, and then at another hearing, I raised it on March 5th of 2008. And I heard nothing more until I got a reply from a subordinate on uh, June 13th uh, of this year that had been uh, punted over to the Department of Justice. 
Uh, and I wrote uh, a pretty hot letter to D Director Mueller, uh, which I ask unanimous consent be included in the record. No objection. And it's uh, 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 the ball is now in your court, uh, Mr. Attorney General. Uh, but uh, leaks uh, are intolerable. When leaks are made, they frequently involve national security, and those leaks are investigated and uh, the culprits are found. And if it's a leak within the FBI, the investigation ought to be just as intense. And uh, uh, this committee expects a briefing, and this committee expects action. And uh, Congressman Weldon doesn't have any rights any higher than anybody else, but his rights are no lower than anybody else's. And uh, we're entitled to an answer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Attorney General, please uh, stand, raise your right hand. Repeat after me. <clears throat> Do you solemnly swear the testimony you give in this matter be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I hope you got it. Thank you. Please go ahead. <clears throat> please go ahead, sir, and thank And again, um, we welcome you from both sides of the aisle. I'm glad you're here. Microphone. Good morning, uh, Chairman Leahy, Senator Specter, and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Since I appeared before the committee six months ago, I've become even better acquainted with the talented and dedicated professionals of the Justice Department and with the work that they do, and I've come to appreciate that much more deeply their service to the nation. I've now been Attorney General, as you pointed out, for eight months, and there's slightly less than seven months remaining in this administration. I'd like, I'd like to outline briefly uh, two areas that I intend to focus on during that time. First, as everyone knows, uh, the election season is upon us. Although state and local governments have primary responsibility for administering elections, the Department must make every effort to help assure that those elections run as smoothly as possible and equally important that the American people have confidence in the electoral process. The Department will maintain a significant presence throughout the election season through both outreach and monitoring. We're going to work closely with civil rights groups and state and local elections officials to identify and to solve problems. We're going to publicize telephone numbers and websites through which people can bring potential issues to our attention. And on Election Day, we're going to deploy hundreds of observers and monitors around the country. Those steps will supplement our ongoing enforcement efforts using the Voting Rights Act and other laws, as the Department has done and will continue to do. Uh, it will do its part to guarantee access of all Americans to the ballot. The Department will also continue its, its efforts to safeguard the integrity of elections by combating campaign finance abuse and voter fraud. All of these efforts are essential in ensuring that the elections reflect the will of the people and in maintaining the confidence of all Americans in our system of government. In all of this, we will be driven by what the law and the facts require, and only by that. Earlier this year, I issued a memorandum to remind all Justice Department employees of policies regarding election year sensibilities. The message of that memorandum, which I reiterated in a speech to our lawyers and agents involved in election cases last week, was simple. Politics must play no role in our efforts. Second, once the November elections are over, there will be the vitally important task of making an orderly and safe transition to a new administration. As part of that transition, we will take every step to transfer smoothly custody and responsibility for our nation's security to a new set of caretakers. We must ensure that all of our country's security measures are attuned to the increased risk we face during this time of transition and that we respond and adjust appropriately. It's also important that we do everything we can to give our national security professionals who will be confronting the al-Qaeda threat well after this administration is over the tools they need to help keep us safe. And it's my sincere hope that the Senate will take a vital step today by passing the bipartisan FISA compromise that passed the House by a wide margin before the Fourth of July recess. I'm also working closely with the director of the FBI to continue the transformation of the Bureau into a world-class intelligence agency. That goal involves developing new ways to recruit, train, and provide career paths for those who wish to devote their careers in the Bureau to intelligence collection and analysis. I'm also reviewing the guidelines governing the FBI's conduct of criminal and national security investigations, 
with the objective of, objective of harmonizing them in a way that gives the Bureau's professionals clear and consistent rules for conducting investigations while maintaining vital civil liberties protections. Before I end, let me briefly address a topic that several of you raised with me in advance of this hearing, namely allegations that have been made about the politicization of the Justice Department. I take those allegations with utmost seriousness. As I've said many times to members of the public and to department employees, it's crucial that we pursue our cases based solely on what the law and the facts require and that we hire career people without regard to improper political considerations. It is equally crucial that the American people have complete confidence in the propriety of what we do. My promise to you is that I have done and I will continue to do what I can to ensure that politics is kept out of decisions about cases and out of decisions about career hiring at the Department of Justice. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I look forward to your questions and again I thank you for allowing me to make this opening statement. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Attorney General. You know, among the most uh, disturbing aspects of these last eight years has been the Justice Department's role in enabling some of the worst of the exec uh, Bush administration's executive power overreaching. They've enabled it by using secret memos from the, from the Department's Office of Legal Counsel, or the so-called OLC. Now, in, all, in my years here in the Senate, we've always seen the OLC as a place to provide impartial, independent interpretations of the law that bind the executive branch and affect people's lives. Uh, so along the lines, when I was a young law student and along with others being recruited by the then Attorney General, Robert Kennedy, uh, who told us all very... Uh, very intently that nobody, not even the president, could interfere with the independent analysis of the law done by the Department of Justice. But often in recent years, we've seen issues from finding torture down to uh, meaninglessness or excusing warrantless wiretapping to absolute immunity of White House and employees, all these legalistic loopholes that come from the OLC. Now, the few that we've seen are disturbing in their disregard of the rule of law. They basically say that the president stands above the law. Now, at your confirmation hearing, you committed to, to this committee, to a number of us, uh, in answering questions from Senator Cole, Senator Schumer, Senator Durbin, me, that you would review these OLC opinions and you would withdraw those you considered without legal justification. You said you would do a review on warrantless wiretapping, interrogation policies, executive privilege. You said this without any reservation or limitation. And we felt that, would, that you were going to step forward and do just that. But in your answer to my written questions, and these were answers we got six months after the hearing, and only as this hearing was scheduled, you said that you have only reviewed opinions regarding currently authorized CIA interrogation programs, you don't find necessary to view any others. Uh, that appears that you've gone back on the commitment you made to this committee to conduct a review of all these OLC opinions. Why have you done that? Respectfully, um, I don't think I went back on my word. I think I went back, I think I w what I said I would do was to review OLC opinions that related to then current interrogation programs. I did, and I came back and said that those programs were in line with the law as I saw it, as it was explained in those OLC memos, and I stand by that. Well, I have since reviewed all significant OLC memos that were issued subsequently um, with a view toward assuring that they are consistent with the law. Um, this committee, I'm sorry. No, no go ahead. Um, this committee um, has received, I think, um, unprecedented uh, review of OLC memoranda relating to both interrogation um, and uh, electronic surveillance. Um, it's received an opportunity to review the entirety, as I understand it, of the OLC memoranda with regard to electronic surveillance. And it's also received in redacted form, to be sure, uh, OLC memoranda relating to interrogation techniques at the same time that the intelligence committees of both houses have received unredacted uh, copies of those memoranda. Um, well, I, I beg to differ with you a little bit on that because 
The, when we ask the questions, and Senator Cole and Senator Schumer and others can speak for themselves, but when we asked the questions, it was not with a limitation of just current ones. What we were asking, what led us to this? Because for seven years, there were OLC opinions that were allowing uh, wiretapping, which has now been found not to be legal, allowing torture was found uh, not to be uh, allowed. All of these things, and it's not just the current ones, because these other OLC opinions are still there. There are a lot of OLC opinions that guide everyday activities of the administration, will guide not only this administration, but the next administration, uh, the, to the fact that they've been referenced by the administration. They speak of an overreaching power of the president, something I'm not willing to give to any president, Democratic or Republican. So, just simply reviewing the current ones, I don't think is enough. What can you make then, if you're not going to review the, those that were used in the past, such as those on waterboarding, will you make them available to this committee so that we can make our own review as to their legal basis? I think that um, OLC opinions uh, relating to wiretapping, um, to the extent that they may uh, speak to a, a program that's already been brought within the Protect America Act, um, don't have a current bearing. Um, I can't make a commitment simply to open the drawers of OLC and expose them to this committee, nor do I think it would be responsible for me to do that. One well, of the Mr. Attorney General, my, my, my point is, it's the, I'm not talking about operational things, and uh, Senator Specter and I have been briefed on the operational aspects. We're not going to go into that here. Uh, what I'm talking about are the opinions and the legal reasoning that basically said the president could ignore laws, could step above the law, or had some inherent authority not to follow the law. And the operational parts will change, of course. And I expect that the operational things will be as we've been briefed for going on now. What I'm concerned about are those parts of the memoranda that said there's this inherent ability of a president not to obey the law. Uh, would you give us at least a, uh, a listing of the OLC memoranda that, that you've decided not to review and a list of the OLC memoranda and opinions that remain in force? I think I have an obligation to assure that decision makers continue to come forward and ask for advice without fear that if they come forward and ask for advice, all of their requests are going to become the subject of examination later on, just as I have an obligation to make sure that the people who give the advice can give it candidly. Um, for me to give an index of all OLC, opinion, regard, all OLC opinions, regardless of whether I've reviewed them or not, I don't know would serve anybody's interest. Um, as I said, I have reviewed so your all answer, Your answer is no. My answer is qualified. Uh, pretty... The, the quali when the qualification is no, that's an answer. My time is up. I'm going to try to keep to the time, and I will come back to the subject, Senator Specter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Attorney General McCasey, the National Security Act of 1947 mandates that the President inform the intelligence committees of both houses on a program like the Terrorist Surveillance Program. Uh, the President did not follow that law for uh, years. Finally, piecemeal told some of the Intelligence Committee members and then others when he needed confirmation of General Hayden as director of the CIA. Uh, did the President's powers as Commander-in-Chief under Article II uh, justify his violating the National Securities Act and not appropriately informing the Intelligence Committees? Senator, um, the terrorist surveillance program, as you know, was brought under the Protect America Act. Um, it is now, the President has said he has all the authority that he needs. And Well, I'm not talking about now. I'm talking about uh, uh, what happened uh, after 9-11 when uh, the President disregarded the statute. I think what happened after 9-11 was a matter of debate between the branches. Um, the President took the view that Congress could not, by statute, limit the inherent authority of Article II. This committee... So the President was right in not notifying the Intelligence Committees? I'm not a court. Um, what, I'm, what I'm qualified well, now to... Now, wait a minute. You're not a court. I know that. Uh, you're the Attorney General. 
you give opinions on constitutional law. You're the man who sat there and said, if he didn't follow my advice, I wouldn't serve him. My advice did not pertain to matters that preceded my arrival. Um, after my arrival, the, the, the terror surveillance program was brought within the Protect America Act. We're trying to get FISA passed today. What we're trying to do is give the intelligence gathering authorities what they need in order to gather intelligence and at the same time give necessary Attorney protection. General Mukasey, rather than fence for several minutes with very limited time, would you give some study to the issue and give us a, a, a considered response on whether the President's authority extended that far? Let me move on to uh, uh, the question of uh, uh, the attorney-client privilege. Uh, uh, where you have uh, the constitutional right to counsel, which we all agree involves confidentiality, and where you have the clear-cut historic obligation of the government to prove its case, uh, what is the justification for uh, coercing a waiver of the attorney-client privilege? Uh, that, that is what happens in uh, uh, real life. In the KMG case, where the Federal Court in the Southern District of New York has uh, found uh, excesses by the government, uh, where you have a clear-cut conflict of interest between the corporation, uh, which is being asked for a waiver, uh, and the individual uh, employee who may have contractual rights to counsel. Uh, uh, what, 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 what is the justification? Can you, can you sparse it as the uh, Thompson memo does and the McNulty memo that if it's a fact question is decided by the assistant attorney general, if it's an opinion or judgment question is decided by the uh, deputy attorney general, uh, isn't the attorney client privilege uh, so valuable that we shouldn't tamper with it by what has worked out to be coercive waivers of the privilege? Well, I think we share the belief um, as former prosecutors and me as, as a former judge that the attorney-client privilege is vital to clients getting advice from their lawyers. Um, I think also we share the view that it should not be tampered with or coerced out of existence. Um, and I understand that you visited with the Attorney General and that he is going to be sending you a letter uh, that will include real significant proposed changes. How soon? Within a day or so. Will we have a memo that we can work from to get your position? Because I know yes. your, your public statement was that you're satisfied with the McNulty memo. Are you satisfied with the McNulty memo? I think my public statement was that the McNulty memo could be used in a proper way. There's no such thing as a memo that achieves perfection. And the, there are adjustments in the McNulty memo that can and will be made, and the, and the deputy proposes to make them. Um, in particular, it will no, we will no longer measure cooperation by waiver of the attorney-client privilege. Well, are we going to get more than a letter? Are we going to get a memo that we can work from to try to see if we can resolve this uh, uh, on a compromise and accommodation? Or are we going to have to move forward to legislate? I think what's going to happen is a, mem is, is a letter that's going to be used, that can be used to prepare a memorandum. Um, that can well, be when will we get the memorandum? You get the letter within a couple of days. The memorandum can be the subject of discussions that may very well produce a memorandum in short order. Um, well, the shorter the order, the better, because it's it, a, amen, matter, amen matter, matter that. percolating and affecting a lot of people. It, it does, and and I don't I don't minimize it. Um, I think that um, we've we've tried to we've tried to strike the balance with the McNulty memo. If we haven't, and there are ways to improve it, then we're bound and determined to improve it. And I think that letter will show that we are. Moving to reporters' privilege in the limited time left, uh, Attorney General McCasey, what was the justification for keeping uh, uh, reporter Judith Stern in jail for 85 days when the source of the leak was known to be Deputy Attorney General Richard Armitage? Well, as you know, I was not on duty when that, when that case was, came to the fore, and, and it's my own view that that case may very well be a better argument against the special counsel than it is in favor of legislation of the sort that's been proposed. Um, I think that Well, I'm not, I'm not uh, prepared to deal with the special counsel because he's not here. I'd, uh, if I had Senator Leahy's gavel, uh, I would have brought him in here a while ago once the case was finished. Uh, but uh, it's very germane uh, in evaluating public policy uh, on whether uh, the Department of Justice ought to have the authority to 
uh, issue a subpoena in the context and move for a contempt citation and hold a reporter in jail for 85 days under very unpleasant circumstances, I can attest to that firsthand. I went to visit her. There's no such thing as jail under pleasant circumstances. It is, it is, an, it is an inherent contradiction and it is something that therefore we use as a last resort and will continue to use as a last resort. Well, why do you need a resort when you know the leak? When um, you know who the leaker is, why go after a reporter and keep her in jail? As I said, now, that I, was, I know uh, that, that would be better addressed to the special counsel. It Someday would. we may have an opportunity to do that, but right now you're all we've got, Attorney General McCasey, and you're the guy who's pushing the policy. So I think it's a fair question to say to you, uh, uh, why maintain a policy which gives uh, whoever the prosecutor is the power to do that when you know who the leaker is? We don't give that power to a prosecutor for precisely that reason. We require a clearance up through um, and including the Attorney General of the United States. The Attorney General of the United States is a prosecutor. My, my, my time is up and uh, I will desist. Uh, we will revisit these issues doubtless. I just want to say I have to excuse myself. We have the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act on the floor, and I have an amendment pending, so uh, I'm going to have to excuse myself. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and I'll be coming over to speak on Amendment 2. I'm going to yield uh, next to, to Senator Biden. Uh, at one point, I'll be stepping out, too, but I'll, we'll keep the hearing going. We go out. Senator Biden. General, I saw your Morning. shoulders sag when the senator said he had to leave. I sure it disappoints you. He has to go to the floor. Um, <laughs> it it uh, does. <laughs> well, let me tell you. I think he's the best questioner and I, here. And I, and I shouldn't. I shouldn't. I'd like over. to. I'd like him to have an hour with you. I think we'd learn a lot. Um, uh, I'd like to ask a, a few questions. I'll try to be as crisp as I can. If your answers could be as crisp as they are as fair, I'd, I'd appreciate it. You indicated that uh, you have worked to see to it that the department is not politicized any longer, or you didn't say any longer, it's not politicized. Yes. I have one simple question. Did you find it had been politicized when you arrived? You don't have to give me any explanation, just yes or no. Did I find it? Yes, did you? When you, when you, you said you came in, took a look. The, I, the, IG, the, IG, the IG found it. Yeah, but well, what do you think? It's amazing. You, you act like you float above the, up in the ether somewhere. I don't, I mean, I don't float ab above yeah. the ether. Well, what did you find? What, what did I you, found, the Attorney General, find? What I found were enormously dedicated people who were very committed to my succeeding. That's not my question. Did you find that some of those enormously dedicated people engaged in politicizing the administration of justice? That was no. my question. No, otherwise I would not characterize them as enormously dedicated. Well, that's but amazing. Get, well, so you disagree with the IG report? I do not disagree with the IG report. The IG report criticized a number of people, two of whom are no longer there, two of whom are there having endured criticism. But did you think the criticism was justified? Yes. You know, you belong in the State Department, man. We could use you up in the, you know, in the Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, you sound like a State Department guy. I, you make a heck of a diplomat. I don't, I, uh, know, the, I don't know what um, Because I, so you, the answer is you did find that it had been politicized and that you, in fact, have changed that? No. I found that an IG report reflected that two people currently employed by the department, one of whom is no longer in the job that he was in, um, had failed to respond with sufficient alacrity to charges of politicization. That's very different from saying that I, I found a politicized department. I didn't say this. I said it had to be. At any rate, I, I'm just trying to get a sense of how you think. I mean, you, you, you really are an enigma to me. Um, and so I, I, I don't mean that as a, as a compliment or an insult. I just find it very difficult to understand you. And like I said, I'm used to talking to a lot of diplomats. I, you know, they're really hard to understand. Uh, um, well, well, let me get right, right to it. Uh, um, the, uh, are you uh, supportive of restoring the burn grants and the uh, and the JAG grants and the cuts that have occurred to local law enforcement, or do you think they're unnecessary programs? I don't think that any program um, that achieves results is unnecessary. What I do favor is, particularly in the budgetary times that we're in, focusing our energies and our assets where they can do the most good, and that's what we've tried to do. And you think the burn grants are not at the top of that list? We have, there are burn grants, there are other grants, um, Putting one thing at the top of the list as opposed to another is not generally my way. Well, that, well it's a requirement. It's called prioritization. 
That's what attorney generals do. Prioritization is in terms of results. Um, well, so let me ask you then, you think burn grants don't produce the results? I think that what produces results are task force programs that we've had in place to lower um, uh, 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 gang and, 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 and gun crime, um, of which grants to, to state and local agencies are a part. Um, but our that, they, they are not burn grants, and well. you have eliminated well. the violent crime task forces. Uh, necessarily, I would argue, the FBI is overstretched. The FBI had to re reallocate a significant portion, roughly 10 percent, maybe a little more of its entire personnel to deal with security issues. Uh, the, the administration did not replace those agents. I've been pushing to add 1,000 FBI agents, uh, total number, um, because of the, uh, the necessary requirement that they be taken off state and local cooperation in these task forces. Um, and uh, there's been resistance to that. And also, uh, then you come along, not you personally, but the administration comes along and cuts programs that have been uh, universally viewed through administrations, Democrat and Republican, as vital to helping local law enforcement, particularly the burn grants and the JAG grants. They've eliminated, you, you've eliminated those. And I just, here, here's my question. Is it based upon the lack of efficacy, or is it based upon what if my friend uh, and I from Arizona once had a discussion about the COPS program? He's one of the smartest guys I know in the Senate, and he, like many argue, and I mean this sincerely, argue that it's not the role of the federal government to assist local law enforcement, that it's about devolution of power, that local law enforcement is local, and there's a philosophic objection to the Biden, to the crime bill that, that says that we're going to provide billions of dollars to local law enforcement uh, because it's essentially a local responsibility and we shouldn't do it. So is the objection that they're not efficacious or is the objection is we just, they're, they're not high enough a priority or is the objection philosophical? The objection, there is no philosophical objection to helping local law enforcement because local, lo local law enforcement is part of solving the same problem we solve. But you understand there is a giant debate in this town, in this country about that issue. So I'm glad to hear you don't think it's philosophical. A lot of people do. Not for me. Oh, good. Okay. Not for me. Um, we have $200 million for the fiscal 09 budget in violent crime reduction, uh, violent crime reduction partnership. We have $2 million in, $200 million in burn grants. We have $2 million in child safety and juvenile justice and $200 million in, in violence for women programs. Those are going to be allocated in the most effective way that we can through what might be termed a competition system, but the competition is going to be based not simply on people's ability um, to write grant applications, but rather on their ability to use those funds in conjunction with our own efforts to have an effect. Well, I, I was under the impression, because I've followed this longer than you have, or anyone I'm, here, I'm and I found them to be very efficacious. I've never heard anybody argue that they're being allocated not based on results, they're being allocated based on some system that needs to be fixed. But let, my time's almost up. Maybe we get a chance to come back to this. Um, the senator from Illinois and I have slightly different bills, but we both have been very concerned about this notion of fugitives. Uh, there are between 800,000 and 1.6 million outstanding felony warrants um, out there, uh, 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 out of 1.9 to 2.7 million state felony warrants that are not in the FBI's uh, national database. And in addition to that, States, as you know, your Justice Department is reporting to you, uh, um, have refused to extradite fugitives across state lines because they don't have the money. And so um, slightly different approaches, but the Senator and I um, each have separate bills coming along saying that we want to provide additional monies for the U.S. Marshal Service and monies for the um, uh, state and local agencies to be able to pick up these fugitives. I mean, I will not, don't have the time and there's no need to go through the detail, but the bottom line is there's rapists who are not being sent back across state lines because they don't have the money, people are being let go, et cetera. Do you subscribe to the notion that this is something that if we uh, um, can come up with the dollars, this is something that the U.S. Marshal Service needs additional resources to be able to assist in? I think that additional resources, that resources are needed uh, to help update the database that allows warrants to be put into the database that's right. used uh, for, for roundups. I think the Marshal Service has conducted sweeps that have resulted in the pickup of enormous numbers of, of fugitives, and I've, I've 
I favor anything that can help that program. Well, great, Thanks. because I, uh, Mr. I realize my time's up, Mr. Chairman. I, I, uh, the U.S. Marshal Service indicates to us that they are really strapped. They just don't have enough personnel. But I'll come back to that. We'll, I thank we'll, you for your we'll time. Come back I thank to you, that. Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you. Senator Hatch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, uh, General. We appreciate having you here before the committee. Uh, your prepared statement noted uh, that some of the positions in your leadership team have been filled, and I'm, for one, glad for that. It's hard to run the department if you can't get people to serve with you in the department. And you and your department uh, need a complete uh, leadership team, and that uh, need does not change according to the election cycles or the political calendar. Some of my colleagues on, on the other side once insisted not only that the department needs new leadership, but it needs Senate-confirmed leadership. However, some important positions still remain vacant, and in my judgment, there's really no excuse for that. And I want to highlight one of them. Grace Becker was nominated last November to head the Civil Rights Division, and this committee held a hearing four months ago. Then she was given hundreds of written questions, in, in my opinion, uh, I think she was treated outrageously. Uh, for someone who served right here on the Judiciary Committee itself, and everybody knows is a decent, honorable, good person. Now, this is a nominee we all know well, someone we all know to be a person of integrity, diligence, intelligence, and compassion. And I know that she is today heading the Civil Rights Division in an acting capacity, but should have, she should have been confirmed unanimously a long time ago, and I just wanted to get that on the record. Now, General McCasey, let me start my the, question. Uh, the, the Senator Vigil, uh, sure. on my time, I, we were still waiting for her to answer her follow-up questions. And, well, we'll uh, encourage her to get those in, well, I, and I it, hope that you'll call her up. And it would, give her it, it would help if she would answer the questions. Well, I, I think asking 200 questions uh, the way they did is uh, not exactly uh, kosher either. But they have a right to do it, and I'll acknowledge that. Uh, General McCasey, let me start my questions by following up on a topic I raised at your confirmation hearing last October. At that time, I described the concern of many that in enforcing the obscenity laws, the Justice Department is targeting too narrow a range of obscene material. The most extreme material may make a conviction more likely, but that conviction has little impact on the overall obscenity industry. And as I said then, I, I believe that the strategy is misguided. Now, you agreed personally to review and consider changing this strategy. Now, I hope you've had an opportunity to conduct that review and that you'll share your conclusions with the committee, if you can. Um, I think what we try to do um, is to bring those cases that we can win um, and those cases that are going to have the greatest impact on remo removing obscene materials uh, which degrade our society and, and, and depict uh, behavior that, that uh, uh, that we think is, is disgraceful. Uh, we've done that. We've had a recent conviction in Tampa uh, of, of, of a large-scale producer of this kind of material. Uh, we want to do it in a targeted, efficient way, and we want to do it in a way that will have the most effect. What we don't want to do is, as you know, there is a, there's a tolerance for this in the courts. We don't want to bring prosecutions that will have the effect, essentially, of making more uh, tolerated uh, the kind of material that we think ought to be stamped out. So we pick our targets carefully. We pick them so as to have the greatest effect, um, and we bring vigorous prosecutions. I appreciate um, the that. Child, the, the child exploitation and obscenity section is involved in that, um, and the criminal division is involved in that. Okay. The Inspector General, uh, the Department's Inspector General recently issued a report looking at hiring practices in the Department's honors and summer law intern programs. And one thing that stands out in that report is that Peter Keisler strongly objected to even the appearance that politics might enter into hiring decisions. Now, I highlight this because Mr. Keisler has been waiting for more than two years for this committee to act on his nomination to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, and by anybody's measure, he's a highly qualified person for that job. Uh, uh, even the New York Times and Washington Post praise him and endorse his nomination. Now, he was serving as Acting Attorney General when you took over last November. He had served in the Department of Justice since June of 2002 as a Principal Deputy and Acting Associate Attorney General and as Assistant Attorney General for the Civil Division. Uh, please give the Committee your insight, your perspective on Mr. Keisler's service at the Department and his overall fitness for the Federal Bench. Well, I have to tell you that my only regret about Peter Keisler is that his tenure and mine um, overlap for only 13 days. Uh, I worked with him closely 
before confirmation. Uh, I worked with him after confirmation. I have spoken to him since. Um, I've met a lot of people in my time who are suited to be federal judges. Um, I don't think there's anybody um, that I could name who has more intellectual and personal qualities uh, that suit him for the federal bench than Peter Keisler. Um, he's one of nature's noblemen. And um, I, I say that without diminishing the quality of the other people that I've met, both people who serve on the bench and people who are candidates for the bench. He is in a separate category. He's absolutely outstanding. Um, he's in the same. You delivered a speech after the retirement of Paul Clement. Um, he is a person in that category, if the category can include more than one person. Well, thank you. As you know, the Supreme Court recently recognized that the Second Amendment to the Constitution protects an individual's right to possess firearms for self-defense in the home. Now, it never ceases to amaze me how some uh, people claim to see all sorts of unwritten rights in the Constitution, but apparently cannot see the ones that are expressly written uh, there as plain as day. They want to read between the lines, but refuse to read the lines themselves. Now, I, for one, am glad the Supreme Court finally recognized this fundamental right. And I want to ask you about how the decision will be implemented. Uh, the court rejected the administration's argument that the case should be remanded to the lower court for application of a lower standard of review. But the court did say that its decision does not necessarily cast doubt on long-standing prohibitions on certain type of firearms or uh, possession of firearms by certain individuals. So I assume you and others of the department have been, study have been studying that decision. And I would welcome your thoughts on how you think uh, it impacts uh, current Justice Department policy or federal statutes that are currently on the books. We have been studying the decision. I think the decision is consistent with the Department's expressed view that the right was a personal one. It is also consistent with the Department's view that it should not and does not interfere with the ability of the federal government to enforce existing firearms laws, including restriction on the nature of certain firearms, including restriction on the possession of firearms by felons and people who are otherwise unsuited to carry them, um, and including restrictions on where they can be carried. Um, that decision explicitly in some instances is entirely consistent with the continued enforcement of federal firearms statutes. Um, and we have no hesitation in saying that, and we have no trepidation in that regard. Well, thank you. My time is up. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Attorney General. A report in the Los Angeles Times last week highlighted the fact that the Office of Professional Responsibility has been conducting investigations into allegations of improper conduct by lawyers in the Justice Department. One concern raised by the article is that the investigations are being kept secret, which is contrary to OPR's usual practice. The Department under this administration has a reputation of using excessive secrecy to keep misconduct from the public Keeping this policy in place simply reinforces Americans' worst fears. As you said earlier, you were put in place in great part to restore the reputation of the Justice Department. In a democratic society, the people have a right to know whether investigations show misconduct by government officials, and I think you would agree with that. So why has the administration changed the OPR policy of making its findings public? Will you commit today to making public the summaries of any OPR investigations that do find misconduct. I certainly agree with the Senator's view that government has to be as transparent as it can possibly be. Um, OPR conducts investigations of lawyers, um, not simply across the board of, of Justice Department employees. Lawyers have particular obligations under the rules of the bar to which they are admitted and under professional standards. Virtually anything can result in the opening of an OPR investigation. Many of those investigations are opened and closed without incident. Um, those that are opened as to which reason for criticism is found can be referred to bar associations and often are. Um, they are in a particular category. Some OPR investigations are carried on along with the Office of the Inspector General, and those are made public. Some OPR investigations are made public on their own. I think it varies from case to case. But one has to be, I think, very careful um, in whether one is going to ruin um, the, uh, the, the professional career 
uh, of a lawyer based on unsubstantiated allegations that simply result in an OPR investigation. Um, I'm, I'm very wary about making blanket commitments with regard to OPR investigations, notwithstanding that um, I am firmly committed to publicizing those things that should be publicized, publicizing joint OPR OIG investigations as they have been in the past um, and will be in the future. When OPR investigations do find misconduct, are you committed to making that public? If OPR investigations find serious misconduct that necessitate the dismissal of an employee, I think that's, that's probably something that should be publicized. Um, OPR investigations that simply say that somebody should receive a private admonition or an admonition um, under the standards applicable to a bar, again, may be referred to the Bar Association for its disposition. Bar associations often get charges that result in private admonitions. Sometimes they get charges that result in public admonitions. And the same is true of OPR investigations. Mr. Attorney General, the Justice Department has spent an enormous time, effort, time and effort prosecuting price-fixing cartels. And yet the worst and the biggest cartel in the world is the OPEC oil cartel. And we've not taken any action against them. The actions of OPEC are one of the main reasons that gas prices are now more than $4 a gallon. I've introduced, and we've had positive uh, response from both houses, uh, the NOPEC bill, which would permit antitrust actions against the OPEC cartel. Would you support the Justice Department having the authority to bring antitrust lawsuits against OPEC member nations? I think the Justice Department um, is committed to competition. I think we've proved that time and time again. OPEC presents a very special problem. Um, we don't want to be in the position of, um, forgive me for the, for the comical illustration of a dog chasing a car, what do we do when we catch up with it? Um, let's assume that we get a verdict against OPEC. Um, OPEC can, as a cartel, essentially cease to do business with us and make things worse rather than better. So we need to be very, very careful about how we approach any sort of antitrust proceeding that could result in a great deal of damage to this country. I don't disagree with that. I'm asking whether you would you would like for the department to have the authority uh, to take action in, in, you know, in case uh, that it decided it was the right thing to do. I would like to be able to look into the issue further than I have, but I think the need for caution is, as you acknowledged, apparent, um, and that is we can't bring actions um, in a way that could result in doing more harm than good. I, I don't disagree, I'm, but the question is would you, which is what the bill would allow the Justice Department, not that they would be required to take action, but that they would have the authority if the, in the good judgment of the department uh, the authority uh, was to be used judiciously. Would you support having the authority, which is what the bill uh, is, is set up to do? I haven't seen the bill. I think how that authority is phrased and what it does not require the Justice Department to take action. It gives and them the authority. I understand that, but the circumstances in which that authority is to be exercised, the elements to be considered, um, and the matters to be considered are all matters of moment. Um, and we have to look very carefully at the consequences. Um, also at how the American people would receive news that the Justice Department is now empowered to go after OPEC. Um, I think we need to be very, very careful about that. I want to look at the bill. I want to look at the language. Um, and I don't want to give an off-the-cuff answer before I've seen it. Um, so it, you don't have an answer to the question? I don't, because I have very much concern, very great concern, with the consequences. And I want to see the bill uh, before I respond um, in blanket fashion, one way or another, that we would welcome having the authority. It's always nice to have authority, I think how it's to be exercised, how discretion is to be exercised. Could you take a look at the bill and, 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 and give, us, uh, give me an opinion? I will certainly look at the bill. I will certainly look at the bill because it's a very important issue. I thank you. I would like to get your opinion on it. Finally, one of the, most, uh, one of the very few industries, Mr. Attorney General, to enjoy an exemption from antitrust law is the freight railroad industry. Because of this exemption, rail shippers have been victimized by the conduct of dominant railroads and they have no antitrust remedies. Higher rail shipping costs are passed along to consumers, resulting in higher electricity bills, higher food prices, and higher prices for manufactured goods. I've introduced a bill to abolish this obsolete antitrust exemption for railroads. Do you agree that this antitrust exemption should be repealed so that railroads are subject to the same antitrust laws 
as virtually every other industry in our economy. I think any antitrust exemption that is uh, out of date or um, counterproductive should be re-examined. And I will, will, will examine that bill just as I would the other bill that you mentioned. I haven't seen it. Uh, but I'm certainly the, the, the antitrust division tries to ensure competition across the board in every industry, be it that one, be it others. Thank you very much. Uh, Se Senator Kyle. Senator Kyle is Thank you, next. Madam Chairman. I want to thank Senator Grassley for graciously uh, uh, switching uh, with me here since I'll have to leave. And I, I'm sorry that I will have to leave after I've questioned. Uh, because of uh, Senator okay, Biden's characterization of my views uh, slightly and accurately, and I know he didn't mean it sure. intentionally, I, I need to take a couple minutes to respond to that. Okay. Um, this had to do with burn grants, and, uh, and Senator Biden acknowledged that uh, he and I have had a lot of conversations about how to utilize the money that um, heretofore has been available for burn grants. Um, it is not my opinion that there is no role for the federal government to assist local law enforcement. Rather, my view is that um, it's a matter of priority and that to the extent that funds are available, we should first focus those funds on areas where there is a federal nexus. For example, on border enforcement, we have a a horrible situation in Pima County and Cochise County and Yuma County, Arizona, where we need far more federal resources to assist our local sheriffs and county attorneys and so on because of the drug smuggling and illegal immigration. That is a place where these funds uh, can very efficaciously be applied. Um, reservations, both Indian reservations and military reservations, uh, especially Indian reservations, in desperate need of more funding. That's a trust responsibility for the United States, and my view has always been that if we have money available, better to put it there than to help the city of Scottsdale uh, hire more police officers, for example. And then finally, in areas of expertise, I mentioned uh, drug prosecutions, but also things like FBI agents who can work on things like bank fraud. That's a very big assistance to local governments, which frequently don't have that kind of capability. So uh, I, I, that, that's the actual uh, uh, view that I have, and I certainly will support more funding in those areas where we uh, have a federal nexus. Now, <clears throat> Attorney General Mukasey, Senator Specter made the point, and, and I agree with him, that and I'll quote him directly, leaks are intolerable. Uh, he mentioned the Kurt Weldon case, and I, I didn't look it up in the dictionary, but to me intolerable means either that action has to be taken to prevent them and or to remediate the situation if they occur, which could also mean prosecution if laws are violated. This, of course, brings up the so-called Media Shield Bill, which uh, uh, Senator Specter alluded to as well. Some of the supporters of this bill argue that um, the national security concerns that you have raised, uh, um, uh, the intelligence community has raised, that I'm concerned with, are ad addressed in the bill by an exception uh, that the bill provides to prevent terrorist activity or harm to national security. What is your view uh, about the exceptions in the bill that uh, purportedly address this issue? My view is that those <coughs> are simply not adequate. Um, the the exemption for um, national security um, would require the government to show that the harm to be done by a publication um, outweighs the good to be achieved by publication with no standard but that um, in mind. Um, the, a judge would have no standard other than his own predilection. Um, also, the government would be put to the burden of coming to court to show even more than has already been disclosed or than may already be, be disclosed for the purpose of proving the possible harm. Um, in addition, um, the, the bill, um, although it may be useful on September 10, um, isn't useful on September 12. Um, in the case of uh, um, investigating uh, prior acts, uh, in the case of investigating material that's already been leaked, um, the burden that's imposed on the government is even higher than the one that's achieved, that, that's imposed before. Um, the, the, um, the bill would require the government to prove um, that information was properly classified, that the person who leaked it, who they already have to know about, um, leaked it um, rather than having 
was, was an authorized possession of it, which would empower, which would enable that person to simply transfer the information to somebody else for the purpose of having it leaked. Um, it would require the government, um, when it was conducting a, a, um, a perfectly valid uh, uh, FISA interception, uh, if a reporter uh, called a, uh, uh, a target of that FISA uh, bill, whether it, was, whether it was a foreign power or, or not, um, to give the reporter uh, notice of the existence of a FISA um, uh, interception, regardless of whether anybody was trying to get confidential information or not. There are just numerous, numerous things um, that, are, that, are, that are defective in the protections that that bill affords. Uh, let, let me see, thank you, and, and let me see if I understand uh, uh, one of the first points you made about September 10th, but not September uh, 12th. Um, I, I think, and I don't have the entire wording in front of me, but that refers to the, uh, uh, the wording in the so-called national security exception that um, provides that it only, um, that the government would have to show by a preponderance of the evidence that the information the government seeks would assist in preventing an act of terrorism. Correct. So after the fact, um, the national security exception doesn't provide you any solace. None. Um, and. I think the, the point here about the only evidence of the leak being the leak itself um, has to do with uh, one of the requirements, which is that there be other evidence uh, of, of the crime. Um, Often the only evidence available to the government is the leak itself. Is the leak itself. So we can't, we can't use that as the, as the only evidence. So the, the bottom line here is that there are uh, serious national security concerns that the exception that purportedly addresses these concerns will need to have additional work before it could uh, at least achieve the, the purpose of, of that exception, I gather, in your view. At the very least. Now, would you also, uh, and just in the last 40 seconds here, my understanding is that this, that the concerns with this so-called Reporter Shield Bill are not just the Department of Justice, but that it also concerns the Director of the National Intelligence, the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of Homeland Security, the Secretary of Treasury, the Secretary of Energy, and the heads of 16 component agencies of the intelligence community, all of whom have expressed their opposition to the bill. Is that correct to your knowledge? It is correct. I think it's fair to say that every um, head of, a na of, of, of an entity that has equities in national security um, has signed on to opposition to that bill. And, uh, I, I and thank you. For, not, and not for no reason. Yeah. Thank you very much. Obviously, in my view is that bill needs a lot more work. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank Chairman. you very much, And again, Senate, thank you, Senator, Senator Grassley. Um, Mr. Mukasey, I'm really very disappointed in your answer to Senator Biden's question. And I want to point out how I looked at the politicization of the department. I believe Several United States attorneys were fired for political reasons. I believe that the Civil Rights Division may well have been politicized. I believe, according to the Attorney General and the OPR, the Honors Program was politicized. The Summer Intern Selection Program was politicized. OLC opinions were politicized. The Civil and Tax Divisions may have been politicized. The voting rights case decisions were politicized, specifically Texas redistricting and the Georgia voter ID. The rules were changed in that division to permit changes that would allow more political effort. The red book was changed to a green book. The hiring of immigration judges were, was politicized based on testimony of Kyle Sam Sampson before this body. And the major was an attempt by the White House to overturn Jim Comey's opinion on the terrorist surveillance program to convince a very sick attorney general uh, to overturn it. If that isn't politicization, I don't know what is. And when you answered <laughs> Senator Biden to say that effectively there was no politicization of the department, it struck me um, quite badly. Um, if you would like to respond to that, I'd be happy to hear the response. I'd be happy to respond to it. Um, two of the items you cite, um, which were uh, the firing of U.S. attorneys 
Um, and one of the other matters you cite are currently under investigation by the Office of the Inspector General along with um, <coughs> OPR. And when those reports are received, they will be reviewed, they will be acted upon. Just as the recent report of uh, the Inspector General with regard to the hiring of summer interns and with regard to the hiring of, of lawyers in the honors program uh, was acted upon. Indeed, actions were taken even before um, he was in place. Uh, that, that report was issued, um, as well as additional recommendations in that report having been embraced. We've revised the rules with respect to contacts with the White House. We've changed those. Um, we've rev revised the procedures that we use for the hiring of immigration judges. We've been hiring immigration judges on a non-political basis um, according to these new rules. So those reforms, those changes, have been put in place, and they're matters of ongoing concern. Um, I'm not unconcerned with that. I'm happy, I'm happy to hear that. Um, when Senator Biden asked you the general question, did you find the department politicized, you essentially said no. And um, what I want you to know is that in the view of many of us, the department has lost enormous credibility because of the things that I've mentioned. Now, I'd like to just move on um, to a question on Guantanamo. Um, on June 20th, the Court of Appeals to the D.C. Circuit issued its first decision reviewing a case of a detainee held at Guantanamo under the review process laid out in the Detainee Treatment Act. And this, of course, is the case of Huzaifa Parhat, a Uyghur who was handed over to the United States after being picked up in Pakistan following the start of coalition bombing in Afghanistan. The Combatant Status Review Tribunal, which reviewed Parhat's case, relied on classified information to conclude that Parhat was part of a Uyghur movement associated with Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. In a unanimous opinion, the D.C. Circuit rejected this argument, concluding there was no evidence to support the assertion. Here's the question. What are your plans, if there are any, for reviewing the case files of other detainees at Guantanamo to ensure that there's adequate evidence to support their detention? As you know, uh, Parhat is certainly not the only, <laughs> the only case before us. Boumediene was, was a substantial uh, change in the landscape, which we are reviewing and attempting to deal with uh, in an orderly fashion with the D.C. District Court that has jurisdiction over that cases, over that over those cases. With regard to Mr. Parhat, the D.C. Circuit found inadequacies in the C-Cert uh, proceeding to which he was subjected, um, and to which of, in which he in which evidence was presented. Um, I think it's fair to say that after. The decision in Boumediene, the, the status of sea certs entirely is 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 a matter that's um, uh, that that's got to change, um, and it's going to change in the direction of having um, habeas proceedings. Um, we're trying to organize an orderly way to address the situation, not only of Uyghurs, obviously, but of others who were detained um, at Guantanamo, so as to assure that their cases can be dealt with in an expeditious fashion. Um, I think it is fair to point out, though, that the CSERT proceeding um, was the result of a statute um, enacted by Congress uh, in 2006 along with the President in response to a specific invitation by the court. Thank you. Thank you. My time is up. Senator Grassley, and I'll turn this over to Senator Biden. Here's the list. Uh, General, usually before I ask questions, I try to point out some communications between your department and me or other members of the committee that may not be answered just to bring them to your attention because you may not know everything going on. And I do this in the same vein that in the, as an example in the 14 town meetings I had last week in Iowa, uh, I always ask people, have I answered your mail? Uh, you haven't answered all of our mail and I'd like to have you start out your meetings by asking each of us if we've answered your letters. But we have a number of outstanding requests, and some of them even been highlighted uh, of my mail in a letter that Chairman Leahy sent to you uh, to highlight it, uh, dated July 1st, 2008. We have outstanding emails, uh, requests for emails related to exigent letters, answers to questions related to Cecilia Woods, 
and written follow-up questions from FBI Director Mueller from March 5th oversight hearing. Uh, and then also to, to inform you that uh, you'll soon be receiving a letter from uh, uh, me as a member of the Finance Committee and Chairman Baucus about uh, correspondence that we sent around six months ago and just recently received a non-response. It involves what we believe is misuse of uh, District of Columbia U.S. Attorney's Office in the intervention of a hearing that we were trying to conduct. We did receive a, uh, a response that was embarrassingly inadequate. So I hope that you would uh, do attention to all of these communications. I'm going to pay attention to those communications. I don't. I I know we did receive recently a um, a letter from from the chairman referring to past correspondence. I don't recall whether it concerned yours. I believe we've dealt with the correspondence that's referred to in that letter. But I um, obviously we try to answer the mail in more senses of that term than one. Okay. And if we haven't, I I, I apologize for it and regret it. Okay. Uh, I think I should, before I ask questions, I think that your department is headed in the right direction in all of these questions that I'm going to ask you now uh, in regard to the, the handling of potential fraud and other problems that come from natural disasters. Uh, the recent uh, floods and tornado disasters in Iowa have taken a hard toll on thousands of my citizens, so I was pleased to see in a recent uh, press release that your department put out warning Iowans not to become, quote, a victim twice, unquote, and to beware of fraudsters trying to steal people's identity by asking for their FEMA registration numbers or Social Security numbers. The Justice Department warned about scam artists preying on disaster victims, particularly contractor fraud, predatory pricing. Uh, the Justice Department also warned uh, about charity scams. Unfortunately, in every disaster, the situation, we have these low lowlifes come out of the woodwork to, to prey on people. Uh, General, have you seen any of these kinds of problems? Well, I'll, three questions. Have you seen any uh, kinds of these problems so far in Iowa? Uh, what has the Justice Department done to get the word out and make sure that Iowa citizens are not victimized by scam and con artists, and what is the Justice Department working, are, are they working with law enforcement officials in Iowa to protect citizens from these things? Well, the U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Iowa has met with local and, and, and state authorities, including the Iowa Attorney General's Office, uh, as well as other federal authorities, to make sure that claims of fraud are coordinated and dealt with quickly and appropriately. I'm happy to say that, as far as I know, so far, we haven't found any instances of federal fraud, although I understand that there are some state fraud uh, allegations, at least, uh, that have been made. We do have available to us uh, on the, 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 uh, the task force that was set up uh, in connection with Katrina, which we could use, at least in part, to address any possible fraud claims uh, that we get here. Uh, so far, as I said, we haven't gotten any, gotten any at the federal level, but we're well prepared I hope to deal with them uh, when, as, and if they come. Well, I think you partly answered my next question. Uh, I, I did send a letter to the governing consuls of inspectors generals asking that they establish a working group that will coordinate government oversight of monies appropriated for disaster recovery in the Midwest. We have a duty to ensure that the money appropriated is spent for its purpose and not uh, going to opportunists. Uh, we've learned the lesson that stopping contractor fraud is uh, upfront cheaper than chasing money. The inspectors general responded and informed me of this disaster working group. I think it's the same one you're referring to that they met on July the 2nd to coordinate uh, oversight efforts. So I would have these questions in regard to that. Oh, is that the same oversight group you were referring to? It may not have been, although the FBI does work closely with uh, inspectors general and the Dutch Justice Department is going to pursue, obviously, any cases that are, that are uncovered by the IGs. So then I think you answered my first question that the Justice Department will lend resources to help ensure that those uh, dollars are protected from fraud. Uh, has the department taken any other proactive steps on its own to coordinate with various federal agencies that will provide disaster relief funds? 
Well, the Office of Justice Programs Bureau of Justice Assistance has developed an emergency incident response plan uh, to help to give technical assistance and to address questions um, about grant programs, uh, uh, problems accessing funds, and to be rebuild program files that might have been damaged so as to make sure that people uh, can meet um, deadlines and can get their applications in on time. And we obviously, where we can provide accommodations, we're going to do so. And we're actively looking at other programs and options to help the people of Iowa recover. Yeah. Now, I, uh, lastly, I, uh, it was about two weeks ago, I led the Iowa delegation in a letter to you requesting a special consideration being given to applications from law enforcement agencies impacted by flooding situations for both COPS and Burn JAG grant programs uh, administered by your department. Uh, they provide vital funding for state and local law enforcement agencies. They help buy equipment, pay training, uh, fund multi-jurisdictional task forces and helping hunt down uh, uh, fugitives, etc. Uh, in, in a time of need following a disaster, these funds can help small rural police and sheriff departments get back on their feet and replace uh, equipment destroyed by flooding. Uh, the deadlines for these programs are fast approaching. They may have to be um, some applications amended. Will the Department of Justice give special consideration to these requests to ensure that law enforcement agencies impacted by flooding are not forgotten? We're certainly going to give whatever consideration we can, and we're going to help them so that they can meet deadlines even where we can't extend them. Uh, so we, yes, we are going to give consideration to those, and, and obviously to the extent they yeah. have more pressing needs, they're going to go ahead uh, on the list. And that's directly related to the flooding? It is. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome, Mr. Attorney General. Thank you. Let me start by commenting on the Inspector General's and Office of Professional Responsibilities recent report on politicized hiring in uh, the department's honor, honors program. The report notes that one of the candidates whom was almost certainly rejected for political reasons was a young man who was first in his class at Georgetown Law Center, clerked for a district judge, and also on the Second Circuit. But he also made a mistake, and that was working as a law clerk for my Judiciary Committee staff, which apparently played a part in disqualifying him for an honors program position. He now works for the Solicitor General of the State of New York, so he has done fine. But for the most petty and inappropriate of reasons, the Department of Justice lost out on a very talented young lawyer. The people responsible not only intentionally interfered with the careers of fine young lawyers, but they damaged the department and the nation. Uh, I want you to know that I find this conduct unacceptable and truly hope that the promises you made to end this kind of behavior at the department are being kept. So my question to you now, however, is more specific. In light of the report, what specific actions have you taken and what further actions do you intend to take to hold those who broke the law here accountable? We have put in place... Uh, a system that assures that all hiring with regard to the honors program and with regard to the summer internship program is entirely in the hands of career lawyers. And obviously anybody who is qualified to serve in the Department of Justice is welcome to submit his or her application and to be evaluated on the merits. But what about accountability for those who did this? I think that um, to the extent that there is to be accountability, that was, that was covered in the OIG report. People who were uh, deficient uh, were, uh, are, are, some of them are no longer at the department. Others came in for criticism. Uh, well, I, I want to review exactly. I, excuse me, sir. No, I, um, if, 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 any, if you can point to any criminal laws that were violated, obviously those well, are I, We will take this up more later, but uh, thank you for that initial response. I am very concerned that, that the message be clear that this is unacceptable and that requires real accountability. In 2007, the Justice Department issued draft regulations to implement a law that gives the Attorney General, uh, rather than the Court of Appeals, the authority to allow states to opt in uh, to procedural rules and federal habeas corpus actions that favor the government and I think disadvantage the inmate habeas petitioner. Now, to get this benefit, states are supposed to prove that they provide competent counsel in post-conviction proceedings. But some serious concerns have been raised about the clarity and completeness of DOJ's proposed implementing regulations. Uh, even the Judicial Conference has asked DOJ to reconsider the regulations, stating that the regulations provide, quote, no guidance about the criteria to be considered by the decision maker, unquote, 
in assessing whether a state has provided competent counsel. I asked you some questions for the record about these regulations after the last DOJ oversight hearing, and your responses were a little more cavalier than I expected, given the gravity of this issue and the significant change in habeas procedure <laughs> that these uh, regulations would implement. Now, before the final regulations go into effect, I want to understand fully the Justice Department's justifications for them. So I'm going to have a number of detailed written questions that I'll provide you after the hearing, but now I'd like your commitment today uh, to answer my questions fully and give your personal attention to them, your personal attention to them, before these regulations are finalized. Will you uh, commit to that? Yes. All right. You mentioned in your testimony that you're trying to determine whether the Attorney General guidelines governing the FBI's investigative activities can be, quote, consolidated and harmonized. According to a report by AP last week, the Department will put in place revised guidelines later this summer that will permit the FBI to open preliminary inquiries of Americans, quote, without any evidence of wrongdoing, relying instead on a terrorist uh, profile that could single out Muslims, Arabs, or other racial and ethnic groups, unquote. And according to the article, quote, among the factors that could make someone subject of an investigation is travel to regions of the world uh, known for terrorist activity, <laughs> access to weapons or military training, along with a person's race or ethnicity, unquote. So let me ask you first. Under these new guidelines, will the fact that a person is of a certain ethnicity or national origin be enough without any evidence of wrongdoing to justify a preliminary inquiry? No. And what that is, that represents no change from prior rules that said that we, that says that we don't use that as the basis alone for predicating an investigation into anyone. These new regulations are a part of a process, um, I don't mean it would be more expansive than you want, and please cut me off if I... Well, let me just do a follow-up question to get the specifics. Thank you for that uh, clear answer. But let me try this one. What about if a person is a U.S. citizen of Pakistani descent who has traveled frequently to Pakistan? Now, would that be enough uh, to potentially, tr let me finish, to potentially trigger an investigation? I think the circumstances of a person's travel would be one element or maybe one element in, in determining whether a person is appropriate for, for conducting an, an inquiry. Um, but I think it's useful to point out that this is part of an ongoing process that's gone on really since right after September 11, and it's gone on with the urging of bipartisan commissions, including the 9-11 Commission, including the Silver Monroe Commission, that the FBI not only be a crime-solving organization, but be an intelligence-gathering organization. And I respect that. I'm a member of the Intelligence Committee, but I'm my specific question was whether a, the frequency of travel by U.S. citizen of Pakistani descent to Pakistan in and of itself would be sufficient to potentially trigger an investigation? I think the regulations, before they come out, will be made known to this committee, uh, will be reviewed with this committee, um, and certainly before they're effective, they will be reviewed with this committee. Um, and I'm not prepared to discuss today particular hypotheticals one way or the other, particularly unmoored from any other evidence that's in the hands of investigators. Um, what, I, what, I, what I do want to point out, though, is that um, the investigations take regulations that apply to the opening of criminal investigations and regulations that may apply to the opening of intelligence investigations and try to harmonize them so we don't have right. cross-cutting regulations. Let me just ask one more question before my time ends, and I appreciate your responsiveness. What about if, if such a person also owns a gun, which, by the way, the Supreme Court just has definitively held as an individual constitutional right, a decision I agree with. Might that person be investigated by the FBI based on that information alone? Senator, again, I, I'm I don't want to get into what ifs when before the regulations go into place. I should point out that when I was a judge, I presided over a case in which First Amendment um, expression uh, was proved as part of a case in which um, otherwise confidential conversations were proved as part of a case because along with other evidence, um, they were relevant in determining whether the defendants in that case were guilty. So I think it's very important to consider all of these matters in context. And I think the regulations will assure um, that the nature of, of evidence to be gathered and the way that it's gathered um, is, is, is subject to review. And also so that it becomes apparent that not only have the ways in which the FBI goes about gathering evidence been, ch it been changed, but also the oversight uh, both within the FBI and within the Justice Department and NSD uh, has been enhanced to keep track with and to keep pace with 
um, the increased authority of the FBI to gather intelligence. And I think um, I'll be following this very closely, closely and will uh, reflect that. I look forward to working with you on this matter as it, as it uh, evolves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, you Senator. <coughs> Senator Schumer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you for being here, Attorney General. Now, Judge Mukasey, at your confirmation hearing, I told you how troubled I was about the allegations of politicization in some of the department's prosecutions. We talked about hiring, but these are prosecutions. In particular, I urge you to get to the bottom of deeply disturbing allegations about the case of Don Siegelman, the former governor of Alabama. I pointed out at the time, although Siegelman was convicted of several counts, witnesses have credibly contended his case was politically motivated and selectively prosecuted. Some of the specific allegations include that Karl Rove asked Jill Simpson, a lifelong Republican and practicing lawyer in Alabama, to try and take pictures of Siegelman cheating on his wife or in compromising positions, that Rove personally contacted the Department of Justice and pushed for a second prosecution of Don Siegelman after a federal judge dismissed the first case against him. Karl Rove, of course, has refused to appear before Congress and testify under oath about his involvement in the Siegelman case. When I asked you to take a thorough and personal look at the Siegelman case, you were reluctant. You said the case was on appeal. And I must say uh, that I think it's time you get to the bottom of this, because there have been some startling new developments in the case since. First. In a highly unusual decision, the 11th Circuit Court released Siegelman on bail, pending his appeal, finding that, quote, there was substantial question of law or fact likely to result in a reversal. Not only that, but in connection with that appeal, 54 state attorneys general, Democrats and Republicans, filed a brief supporting the appeal. That's an astonishing bipartisan act, knowing that prosecutors are very reluctant to take issue once a jury has convicted somebody uh, from the Justice Department. I think it underscores the flimsiness of the case and the concern about selective prosecution. And I have to tell you, nothing, I think, has troubled me more than this. This is almost like, if the allegations are true, obviously that's a big if. It's like making the Justice Department uh, the Justice Department in a banana republic. You don't like someone, you go after them, you prosecute them on flimsy evidence. It's really troubling. So I want to ask you some questions about this, because I am deeply troubled about this. And it is the kind of thing that I believe that you, when you testified before us, would want to get to the bottom of and eliminate even the appearance that something like this happened. So first, um, there is, in fact, an OPR investigation underway in the Siegelman case. Is that correct? Yes. OK. Do you know when it began? No. Could you find out for us? I suppose I could find out when it began. OK, good. Um, do you know when it will be complete or how far along it is? I meet regularly with the head of OPR, um, and I don't want to get into those particular meetings. Um, I, I, I mean, obviously, the, they're, they're working on it, as they are on other, on other matters, along with, o, along with OIG, when there are joint OIG investigations. And I have no reason to believe that anybody's slow rolling that or dragging Well, do you ask questions and make sure that that's occurring, that this is given? This one is different than lots of other cases. It's when 54 attorneys general write a letter, when the 11th Circuit says, calls into question the conviction on basis of some fact or law, uh, then, and the allegations are, you would admit, if the allegations are true, it would be stunning. Isn't that correct? Um, if the allegations are true, it would be stunning. I think it's fair to point out that the 11th Circuit's decision had to do with issues raised on appeal I understand. Uh, by Mr. Siegelman that went to particular counts in the indictment, and that did not go to the matters that you discussed. But I certainly agree that if the allegations you make are true, that would be stunning. OK. So shouldn't this get a high priority from OPR? I think it, I think it has a okay. financial priority. That's what I want to make I, sure I, I'm of. Not, I mean, I'm not, when you said before, well, there are a whole lot of things they investigate. No, no, no. I'm not suggesting that this is down on the list um, okay. at all. OK. Do you think, can you assure us it'll come to a conclusion before this administration's end? I have every reason to believe that it will. Good. Uh, do you know how many lawyers or investigators are working on it? No. And I don't know that with respect to any investigation. Right. By but OPR, OPR, this is not like the IG. You're, you appoint the head of OPR. Serves at your pleasure. Um, 
I did not appoint this head of. I understand. You have the authority to appoint. And Marshall Jarrett is a superbly qualified okay. person. Okay. I don't and think of anybody so who's ever qualified. Do you believe there are enough resources? Yes. Uh, being done, uh, Certainly used on this there case. Is. Okay. Now, next question. And this one's pretty serious. Will you make the OPR findings public when the investigation is complete? I know you had a general discussion with Senator Cole. That depends on what they are. And I, for the same reasons as concern my discussion with Senator Cole, the same reasons apply to this. Um, I don't know what, in advance what OPR is going to find. But don't you think either way, no matter what they find, given the seriousness of these allegations, calling into question the very fundamentals of neither fear nor favor before the law, that these should be made public. If they say there's nothing wrong, I'd want to know. And if they say there's something wrong, what would be a reason not to make this public? I think there are various avenues open for exploring those allegations, including exploring their source um, and having, having testimony on the subject. Uh, OPR is not the only avenue. Well, I understand that. But why wouldn't you commit to making this public? For the simple reason that I don't know what the conclusions are going to be. Available. Well, give me a reason, just give me a hypothetical reason why they shouldn't be made public. If OPR determines that somebody did nothing wrong or yes. that a lawyer neglected to attend to a detail in a way that, that, that under state law would warrant only a private admonition for me to make those public. Okay. Think, well, let me ask you this. If, and this is a big if, if OPR finds that there were political interference in the case, will you make it public? Will you make that part of it public? If it's not think, a lawyer making some kind of... I think cases are brought um, for all kinds of reasons. Okay. Um, and we've, I've, we've, all, we, I've, I've had the experience of having a divorced wife walk in, having had the goods on her ex-husband, um, and deliver them um, and, and, and bring a case for that reason, because she'd like to see him suffer. Uh, that's not a noble reason. Okay, but that's it's not, not a, what we're not discussing here. Not bringing the case. That's not what we're discussing here. I asked you if the allegations that are true, that are made are true, that there was political interference. Is there any reason not to make that public? If there's interference with the course of a case, um, that's, a whole, that's a matter of a whole different... Well, how about if, if Karl Rove did suggest a second prosecution for Siegelman after the first? That's, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of if that depends on the underlying evidence. And I think we ought to... Well, why shouldn't it be public evidence. regardless? Whatever the underlying evidence is, there may have been... He may have come across some new fact. He may indeed. Okay, but why shouldn't that be made public? You're not giving me a very good reason, sir. Um, I don't see um, publicizing the source of an allegation um, if the allegation turns out to be true. Yeah. Let me ask you one more question with the Chair's indulgence. Should Karl Rove be interviewed in this case? It, that is a matter for, for OPR. To what do you think? Um, you're, the OP, you're the ultimate authority here. I'm not the ultimate authority here. Um, I've, you, I, I have not supplanted, I have not supplanted um, OPR, and I don't intend to. I intend to look at their report, and if, there is, if it's in any way deficient, I intend to You don't to think them. that given the allegations that have been made, serious allegations that have gotten scores of Democratic and Republican attorney generals to, do, to uh, ask that this case be reexamined, that Karl Rove should maybe not be interviewed here? I think there are avenues for conducting examinations other than the OPR investigation, other than my suggestion. And do you think someone in the Justice Department should ask Karl Rove whether he was involved, whether he did the things that are alleged? I think someone that, somewhere, or should, should, is there a possibility no one should ever ask him? I think that very much depends on what the facts are that are found by OPR, and I don't know what they're going to be. I find these answers very disappointing. I think <laughs> Senator Schumer has his concerns or reflect some of the same concerns you've heard from uh, on a, <clears throat> the same nature as the concerns you've heard from Senator Specter and myself. And they are, they are concerns that have been expressed by a lot of people on this committee. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman. Welcome, Attorney General Mukasey. Thank you. In the uh, eight months you've been in office, have you had occasion uh, to determine yet whether waterboarding is torture? No, because as I said, it has not been proposed to be returned to the program, and it's not part of the program. 
In that answer and answers you've given to Chairman Leahy and answers you've given to Senator Feinstein and answers you've recently given to Senator Schumer, um, I detect a very pronounced reluctance to look backwards into the problems at the Department of Justice. You have assured us, for instance, that uh, politics will be kept out of prosecutions under your watch going forward, but the effects of prosecutions, of politics on past prosecutions, are still very much alive and well for the subjects of those prosecutions. You've assured us that you've reviewed the OLC uh, opinions regarding current programs, but past OLC opinions done in the politicized atmosphere of OLC at that time continue on the books as precedent to be counted in the future and now. You have stated that you have changed and remedied the politicized hiring policies of the Department of Justice, but people who were hired pursuant to the politicized hiring policies are still there. So for many of us on this committee who care very deeply, and I hope you understand sincerely about the integrity of the Department of Justice, it is highly inadequate to have this I'll only look going forward approach that I detect. It is very important, I think, that we also be prepared to look backwards, find out exactly what went wrong, and clean it up. Because if we can't be assured that you're looking backwards, we can't be assured that it's been cleaned up. And if we can't be assured that it's cleaned up, we can't be satisfied that the Department of Justice is back where it needs to be. Um, you've raised a variety of subjects. I think with regard to interrogations, it's important to point out that the law has changed very much since the original memos were written. You have access to, and you in particular, because your, your membership overlaps, as I understand it, with both the Intelligence Committee and this committee, you have access to unredacted copies yeah. of the operative memoranda. Um, so you know it was decided in the past, and you know it was decided today. Yeah. Um, and what I, I'll tell you what I've seen. I've seen what I consider to be exaggerated and unreasonable claims of executive authority far beyond what reasonable debate would permit. I've seen dramatic lapses of very basic scholarship uh, these are now the subject of OPR investigation. Uh, there are public reports that department leaders have said when people see these opinions, they will be ashamed of them. And repeatedly, we've seen opinions of OLC retracted as uh, wrong or ill-advised, which is highly unusual. When you put all that stuff together, it's hard not to look back at OLC as what I've said on the Senate floor, George Bush's little shop of legal horrors. It is just not adequate to say, okay, well, it's going to be fine going forward and not look back and, and assure us that there has been a hard look back and that we are cleaning up OLC. It's a vitally important thing, and it's not just, Mr. Attorney General, it's not just about your personal integrity. I'm not here to challenge that. I don't challenge that. I have confidence that under your watch things will be done right. But as Jack Goldsmith pointed out in his book, there are um, to use his phrase, a number of practices that OLC has developed over the years to help it avoid errors and to compensate for the fact that its opinions are not subject to the same critical scrutiny of adversary process and dissent that characterize the judiciary. He goes on to say that OLC has not always followed these norms and practices during the past six years. It seems clear that had these norms and practices been followed, OLC would have avoided some and perhaps most of the mistakes that it has made. And I really think we need to join on that issue because OLC is far too important to be allowed to continue with any question about its integrity. I think the fact that um, OLC opinions have been withdrawn is itself evidence that um, OLC is not simply operating uh, as uh, somebody's shop of horrors and that when matters have to be reexamined, they are reexamined. Um, the two, the but what it doesn't answer is the question, what went wrong at the time that allowed opinions that are so embarrassing that they don't meet basic standards of legal scholarship, that have to be withdrawn, that are described as a cause for shame to the department, what went wrong to cause that to happen? That I think is a matter of legitimate inquiry and I'm concerned that you don't seem curious about that. I think one of the things that went wrong, I wasn't there at the time, but I think one of the things that went wrong at the time is the phenomenon described in the book that you mentioned. And that is what the author of that book described as a cycle 
of aggressiveness and timidity um, in, in, um, in, in, in the intelligence community in responding to requests for information. We have people demanding that, that people push the law to the limit, and then we have people saying, don't push the law to the limit, um, and that you're subject to, to criticism and prosecution afterward, that that is a very unwise cycle. Um, after September 11, there was an enormous amount of pressure um, to find um, the maximum that could be done. There were opinions prepared that were not up to the standard of OLC, uh, that were later withdrawn, but it's fair to say that the, the conclusions, the ultimate bottom line conclusions of those opinions were unchanged. Uh, that is, that practices that were permitted under the laws that then existed were in fact permissible, although not for the reasons outlined in those opinions. Um, and as to some of those matters, it's, it's, it's fair to say that things were explored um, and the subject of, of, of commentary and of, of consideration that were never adopted. And I think it's important to make sure that at a time like that, people come forward with whatever ideas they have, both good ideas and perforce bad ideas. Um, the bad ideas hopefully don't get adopted. But when they do, to me, it's a signal that something is wrong. I think the point and when, let me give you my favorite example, because it just drives me nuts. There is a Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals opinion called United States versus Lee, in which the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals reviewed conduct by a Texas sheriff and described it as water torture. I think they used the phrase torture seven times. And if you look back into the record of that case, you see that the water torture they're describing is waterboarding. I mean, there's just no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's absolutely clear. It's a case that was prosecuted by the Department of Justice itself. The person who prosecuted, I understand, is still in the department. It's on the books of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. It's a significant case. If this matter were being briefed to you as a judge and a party had missed that case, I think you would be justifiably angry and disappointed at the failure of legal scholarship that didn't find the case. What concerns me isn't that the OLC disagreed with that case, it's that in a 50 plus page opinion they never found it, or they did find it and didn't bother to discuss it. And they discussed very similar cases uh, where they could find an exception here where I don't think the exception that they found in the other cases existed. Something went badly, badly wrong over at OLC, not just people being a little energetic. And it can recur if we don't figure out what happened and prevent it from happening again. Senator, respectfully, um, I agree with your interest in thoroughness. I agree with your interest in, 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 in balanced consideration. But the case to which you refer was prosecuted under the civil rights laws. It was not a case that dealt with whether a technique is or isn't torture under the torture statutes. That case was properly prosecuted under the civil rights laws, would be prosecuted today under any standard under the civil rights laws. Um, that wasn't the issue. Indeed, the issue on appeal didn't even concern the civil rights law. No, but when the United States Court of Appeals described the specific technique as issue, as torture, isn't that relevant to a decision? Do you really mean to come before this committee and say that a Court of Appeals decision that describes the specific technique at issue before the Office of Legal Counsel as torture is not relevant to a discussion of whether it's torture under a in, different statute? In fairness, I don't think that was the Court of Appeals' choice of words. It was quoting from an indictment. Um, it was quoting from the way the matter had been referred to below. No, that's not accurate. Um, I think it is. Um, the My time is up. I apologize. I've gone over. It's all right. We'll have a chance to go back. What I'm going to do is uh, recognize Senator Cardin now, and then we're going to take a 10-minute break as soon as Senator Cardin's questions are completed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Mr. Attorney General, it's nice to see you. Good to see you. I certainly want to concur in, in the comments of my colleagues about the, the prior problems within the Department of Justice and dealing with those in the most transparent way possible. I mean, the, a lot of the problems in the Department of Justice were basically as a result of a failure to um, provide a, a public explanation. And I think the more transparent it's done, the better it will be for the Department of Justice and just want to urge you to do that. I, I want to talk about the issue you and I have talked about on many occasions, and that is the traditional role of the Department of Justice as it relates to civil rights issues. And we've had some, I think, some very positive discussions about that. I was pleased to see in, in your written uh, comments about 
your uh, commitment uh, in regards to the election uh, process and to, uh, as you put, guarantee the integrity of our elections. And I agree with you that protecting voting rights and combating fraud are two sides of the same coin. And I was pleased to hear your, your, your comments on that. I, I want to ask you about your plans for the 2008 elections. There are some issues that can be anticipated that by an active Department of Justice uh, we can avoid problems in 2008. Uh, issues such as having adequate voting machines and taking precautions to make sure that people know about uh, their rights uh, of voting. And that can be done in, in advance. Some of the issues are, are more difficult when you have 11th hour uh, types of material that we saw in Maryland and other states which are aimed at minority communities and give them uh, fraudulent information are a little bit more difficult to try to avoid through your preliminary work, but by putting a spotlight on this concern, you can, I hope, discourage uh, that type of, uh, of conduct by, by our, our, certainly our major parties. So I, I want to ask you, what specific programs are you planning to put in place uh, so that uh, we can try to have the, the widest possible participation in the 2008 elections and avoid any type of fraudulent activities? Every single district, every single district in this country is going to have a specific designated assistant U.S. attorney and investigator schooled in voting laws and enforcement of the civil, of the, uh, 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 the, the, the of, of voting, voter, voter access laws uh, and other laws. Uh, and is going to be alert to precisely the kind of practice that you identified, namely misinformation, uh, which, as I've said in our private conversations, is just as much fraud as any other kind of fraud. We also have um, monitors and inspectors who are going to focus on particular districts, districts that are the subject of consent decrees, districts that, that have been historically districts where problems have been encountered. And we're prepared to go into those districts uh, to, to head off precisely the kind of practice that you've talked about. Um, that's, that's, what we're, that's what we're going to do, and that's what we're training people uh, to do at the, at the National Advocacy Center and, and I, elsewhere. I read in your, your written testimony about the monitors and that they've already been, um, some have already been in, um, placed. Uh, I think that's an extremely important part of, of your strategy. I, I would just encourage you in your involvement in placing monitors to take a look at previous activities. I know you need to deal with the areas that are under uh, court supervision, but also to take a look at using the monitors uh, in uh, areas that have recently shown some, some, some challenges, but also to share that information uh, afterwards so that we can have a better understanding of the problems they're confronting uh, to try to put in place the institutional protections against uh, the newer types of frauds. I agree that we ought to publicize that information afterwards. And um, we're gonna, we're gonna, we will have people uh, looking for precisely the kind of conduct that you mentioned. Now, let, me, uh, let me just mention some of the new, some of the issues I think are, will be confronted in this election. If the primary is any indications, primaries are any indication, there's been an unusually large number of young people who have gotten involved in this political process. Uh, when our college campuses return in September, my guess is that you're going to see more political activity than we've seen in, in prior elections. What steps are you taking to make sure that students uh, are able to fully participate in the political process, uh, knowing full well that it may challenge some of our local um, election boards? We've tried to make sure that the statutes relating that require um, all state laws that provide services uh, to people to permit um, or to encourage voter registration at the same time. The most famous of those is the motor voter registration law, but there are other related statutes. Um, and we're making sure in reaching out to state and locals that we make certain that they're, they, that they're doing that. Well, I'd encourage you to put as, as some attention to this, knowing that, that we could expect some significant increases in participation by students who may very well be eligible to participate in a particular state and uh, may find some difficulty in um, uh, or obstacles that are placed in their way. We're also, we're also trying to make 
known uh, telephone numbers and websites, uh, and students are particularly adept at, at, uh, at use of the internet, websites that people can contact uh, to make them aware of what their rights are um, and of how to get access to the ballot. And, and let, let me point out that, as you know, the management of our election system is such a hodgepodge nationally. It's a federalist system, so you have but states and counties. The states are principally in charge. Right. Uh, but, and, and the the political oversight is different throughout the country. It really cries out for the Department of Justice to pay a little attention to this as it relates to legitimate federal interests in protecting the right of, of, of people to vote. So I just urge you to get a little bit more involved in that. Uh, there are other issues obviously involved in civil rights and housing and employment. And uh, uh, give you just the last 30 seconds I have if you wish to comment further as to the activities in, in the Civil Rights Division. I think we've been very active in the two areas you mentioned, uh, housing and employment. Uh, we've tried to bring the kinds of actions that have the maximum amount of impact under Title VII. Um, the Housing Division, uh, which I recently visited, uh, brings something on the order of, of, uh, of, of 21 uh, uh, pattern practice cases a year, uh, has numerous uh, test teams out uh, protecting housing rights. Um, we try to we enforce these across the board, um, and I've I've made that particular uh, division, which has become really a defining division for the Justice Department. And it was it was created within the last 50 years, but it is probably the defining division of the Justice Department. My particular focus. Thank you, Mr. thank you, Mr. Chairman. And he's told me the horror stories of what went on in his own election in Maryland, uh, one of the more progressive states. And you've talked about the, you mentioned the phone lines ready to handle calls, but receiving complaints is not quite enough to protect the right to vote. And once a, a complaint is received, what does the department do to dispel erroneous information? I, we report an important bill, the Deceptive Practices and Voter Intimidation Prevention Act, of 2007, uh, some months ago, that require everybody to be more proactive from the Department of Justice. The bill's principal sponsor is Senator Obama. Obviously, I'm concerned that his supporters not be precluded from voting, just as I'm concerned that Senator McCain's supporters not be precluded. There are 20 co-sponsors on it, uh, ranging from, uh, I think it'd be fair to say, for the most conservative, uh, uh, members of the Senate to the most liberal. So let me ask you this. If you have a place where photo identification is not required by state law, for example, in my state, how would the Justice Department correct the rumor that photo ID is required to vote in that jurisdiction? You know, these rumors start in jurisdictions that don't require it, but you have to have photo identification. If such things start, and they have in the past, how do you respond to that? Um, Senator, you correct that lie um, the same way that you correct any other lie, and that is by pouring truth on it. Um, if people are giving misinformation about what it takes to vote, about where the vote is, and about when the vote is, then you make absolutely certain that the state authorities are dispelling that rumor. Um, there are public um, service announcements that, that can be made. Um, there are all kinds of ways of dispelling information. Well, These papers can be used. Um, announcements can be let's used. Let's take something that's a little bit, it gives you a little bit more of a heads up. Latino American voters were sent letters in some uh, precincts last time they couldn't vote because they're immigrants. Uh, I mean, these are citizens. Uh, how do you, how do you, I mean, are you proactive enough that you can get letters out to those same people? And, I can't tell you as I sit here that we can get a letter to absolutely every one of those people. We can certainly work with organizations that are active in the Latino community and would to make certain that they could tell people in that community that what they were being told was absolutely false and that they had it on the word of the United States government that it was false. Um, well, that, is, that is fraudulent conduct. We're seeing in the... Um uh, we're seeing in so many states during the primary season an unprecedented turnout. Even in my little state of Vermont on our town meeting day, which people don't vote that much unless there's a major bond issue or, or a local race, we had the highest number we've ever had. Uh, the, uh, 
they have an excellent Secretary of State, Deb Markowitz, we use paper ballots most of the state, and she anticipated this and had ballots printed up. But um, we saw a number of places during the primary season where people ran out of ballots. I, is there any kind of a proactive step to make sure that doesn't happen? Well, certainly people who are denied access to, to a ballot for any improper reason have the remedy under federal law of a provisional ballot. Um, we are trying to make sure in consultation with state and local authorities that they've got enough in the way of equipment and the proper equipment that that, that, that doesn't happen. Um, can I guarantee you in advance that it won't? No. Um, I can guarantee you that we're doing whatever we can to prevent or mitigate it. Well, I, and I look at, for example, uh, another thing that's happened last time, and I'm using the past as prologue, uh, again, to use the example of my state, when you, the last person is, or when 7 o'clock comes, polls close, if there's a line out into the street, they usually put a sawhorse or a cone or something behind the last person. And, but how do we make sure that states... Allow that. We we had instances of states the whatever the poll and close time says eight o'clock comes, and they say okay we're closed. There might be five hundred people in line. If violated, that'd be a violation, would it not? If, as I sit here, I I don't I can't tell you precisely, but if that's a violation of federal law, then somebody ought to get a federal judge to mandate uh, the continued operation of that polling place, um, and I'm sure that the core of, of assistant United States attorneys who are being trained um, at the NAC uh, would be available to do precisely that. Let me go to a different subject, which is going to be a subject of a hearing here. We, we found in March that the passport files of presidential candidates were breached by the State Department. And we, a matter of some concern to everybody, whether you're breaching your IRS or the State Department or anything else, uh, Senator Specter and I as sent you a letter asking you to take immediate action. It was Senator McCain, Senator Obama, Senator Clinton's passport, who knows who else. And uh, we asked that you, what preliminary steps you're taking to make sure whether these violated federal laws, such as the Privacy Act. We wanted to make sure, you said in your briefing, you're waiting for a box of evidence. Um, yesterday, we sent this letter in March. Yesterday, we received an answer. The matter has now been referred by the State Department's IG. is being handled by prosecutors in the criminal division. They found that um, uh, they did a sample of 150 high-profile Americans. They found they've been searched a total of more than 4,100 times over the past five and a half years. And, of course, these have name, date, place of birth, Social Security numbers, and so on. Um, we have widespread abuse of electronic records, 20,000 government workers and contracts had access to it. What specific steps are you taking to make sure this stops? I mean, this, we're always asking Americans to get more and more their personal data. You have to, I do, but we, we're told, don't worry, it's being kept safely. Is somebody going to go to jail for this, what I'm going to? Senator, leading up to. as you point out, we received yesterday um, a referral from the IG's office at the State Department. Um, that was referred to the criminal division. That case is going to be followed up on. And if somebody committed a crime, we are going to do our level best to make sure that somebody goes to jail, because that is a deterrent. Um, it is the ultimate deterrent. It's, it's one of the better deterrents. Well, let's, uh, we'll, we'll, keep in, we'll keep in touch with that. And we're going we're gonna, and we're gonna to follow and prosecute that case, the prosecutable case. Good. I mean, I, I want someone to go to jail. If they're, do, I, they're snooping on Senator McCain's passport or Senator Obama's passport, I don't care who it is. The fact that they're doing this or they're snooping on John Jones' uh, passport, uh, they shouldn't be allowed to do that. Senator Durbin. Attorney General, thank you for being here. I'm not going to replow the ground about Stephen Bradbury's memos. He's been lauded in this committee, and, and yet there seems to be a reluctance to even review things that he's written. Um, he is not going to be appointed, uh, if that's still the administration's intent, uh, to a permanent position with the OLC. 
But I would like to ask you to, to help me understand what your plans are for the next few months. In less than four months, the American people will make an important decision in an election. In less than six months, there'll be a new president. And I think that um, there are two courses available to you uh, as you close out the remaining six months of your tenure as Attorney General. Under one course, um, that you will initiate no major investigations, raise no important questions about the conduct of the Bush administration relative to the treatment of detainees. The other possibility is that you will uh, follow what I think is the clear standard of the law within your own department and initiate those investigations. Under the Attorney General guidelines, which were signed by John Ashcroft in 2002 and remain in effect, a preliminary inquiry should be undertaken when there's information or an allegation which indicates the possibility of criminal activity and whose responsibility uh, requires some further scrutiny beyond checking initial leads. This is a pretty low standard. Now we have had reports, a variety of reports. Major General Antonio Teguba, who led the United States Army's official investigation of Abu Ghraib, had this to say recently, and I quote, the Commander-in-Chief and those under him authorized a systematic regime of torture. These are Major General Teguba's words, not mine. There is no longer any doubt as to whether the current administration has committed war crimes, the General said. The only question that remains is whether those who ordered the use of torture will be held accountable. And then, of course, the Justice Department's Inspector General issued a troubling report about the FBI's involvement in detainee abuse and concluded, and I quote, we found that the FBI did not respond to repeated requests from its agents in the military zones for guidance regarding detainee treatment. I have written several letters. Senator Whitehouse joined me in those letters uh, to you and to others asking if you were going to investigate whether there was any criminal wrongdoing by members of this administration relative to the establishment of standards for the treatment of detainees and the use of torture. And the responses which I've received have not been satisfying. You've said that no one who relied in good faith on the department's past advice should be subject to criminal investigation for actions taken in reliance on that advice. That wasn't what we suggested. Rather, we suggested the Justice Department investigate and explore whether waterboarding was authorized and whether those who authorized it violated the law. Now, we know we've written to the Office of Professional Responsibility and asked them, uh, what are they doing? What are they looking into? And in February, they wrote back to us and said that they have a pending investigation to be released, or at least a report to be released, depending on your approval of its release. I'd like to give you this opportunity at this hearing to tell us, will you follow Attorney General Ashcroft's standard, which he signed and is still in effect, to investigate any wrongdoing relative to the treatment of detainees? Will you authorize the release of this Office of Professional Responsibility report? Can we expect in the last six months of this administration that you will step away from some of the things that have occurred in the past and make a clear break and initiate this investigation? You've asked um, a variety of questions and made a variety of statements about a variety of situations, and it's hard to sit and unpack them all, but um, the treatment of detainees was the subject of at least a dozen or more investigations at the Department of Defense, which has principal custody of them, as you know. Um, many of those investigations resulted in not only discipline, but in the prosecution by court-martial of people who were involved in that activity. So far as the OIG report uh, with respect to the conduct of the FBI, um, it recommended no reference, no criminal reference with regard to anything that any FBI agent did, and indeed pointed out that one of the investigations that was conducted um, by the Department of Defense came in response to reports received from the FBI. Um, the FBI's role there was, a, as, as I read the report, was a positive one, um, not, a, not a negative one. Um, there, there were people who, um, who responded and who did what they should have done. 
and I, I, that's, that's, what I, that's what I took away from that report. What about the CIA, our civilian political appointees, who authorized the conduct? Any CIA agent who acted in good faith reliance on a, an opinion uh, by the Department of Justice that his or her conduct was lawful cannot and should not be prosecuted for the very simple reason that if they are, then or else any, or any opinion by the Department of Justice to anybody on the front lines is totally and completely useless. So let's um, take it the next step. What about those at the department who authorized that conduct, which has now been found to be wrong? It's, in essence, the same answer. Um, it refers back to... Who's in charge if it's the same answer? At some point, someone has to be held accountable. It's the same answer. It's the answer that was really given in Jack Goldsmith's book, and that is that there is a cycle of demand for aggressive opinions um, and then a reaction to that. Um, I think what lawyers have to do is adhere to the law and not concern themselves with what might be politically acceptable later on. And if we go after them and prosecute them, then that's exactly what they're going to be concerned with. May I they suggest the standard is legally acceptable? Yes. Isn't that what the Attorney General Ashcroft standard is here? Legally, not politically acceptable? That remains the standard. That always was the standard. And isn't that your responsibility to enforce? It was, and I, it is, and I do. And do you believe that, well, let me ask you this. Are you going to release this report, which Mr. Jarrett has referred to in February, the results of their investigation of the Office of Professional Responsibility? Will you approve the release of that report? I'm not going to improve the release of an OPR report with respect to the conduct of professionals. Um, if professionals have to be disciplined, they can be disciplined in a way that is either private or public, depending on the nature of their violation. Mr. If Chairman, I'd like to ask that this letter be part of the record, and I'd like to quote from it. Marshal no, Chair, Counsel from the Office of Professional Responsibility, February 18, 2008, and I quote, Upon completion of our investigation, we will provide you with our results. This is directed to Senator Whitehouse and myself. Moreover, because of the significant public interest in this matter, OPR will consider releasing to Congress and the public a non-classified summary of our final report. Are you saying that you will not approve the release of that report? If OPR wants it released, it'll be released. So you give your approval of that release? If OPR wants it released, it'll be released. That's progress. I yield. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Biden. Thank you very much. much. General, let's say in, this, in the general territory here, obviously the Supreme Court's decision several weeks ago on Guantanamo Bay and habeas corpus uh, um, received a great deal of uh, um, coverage and uh, publicity and conversation and debate. Um, what steps has the department uh, made to respond to and implement the court's decision? I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear I, I beg your pardon. Let me I, I speak more clearly. <clears throat> the Supreme Court decision of several weeks ago relating to the right of habeas corpus of those detained at Guantanamo Bay. What steps has the department made to respond to implement the court's decision? The department has been working with the district court in the District of Columbia to arrange an orderly way of determining when habeas petitions will be heard, how they will be heard, uh, what evidence we will be received, and how it will be received. Um, all of those. Is that in the form of a negotiation with the court, or I'm uh, not negotiation? In, in, I mean, it's, 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 I'm not trying to be uh, um, confrontational. I mean, I'm just trying to understand. Is it a, a an, in a sense, a mechanical thing, trying to figure out how to manage this? Or, I mean, I'm not certain what you mean by mechanical, but it's yes, it's figuring out how to manage it. Yeah. Um, it's figuring out what evidence can be received on on. on what the practical considerations are. That word appeared throughout uh, the Boumediene decision. That is, that the decision was to be made practically given what was possible, right. given yeah. what evidence was available. And so all I'm trying to get at is, uh, in we are in, implementing we are in this, the decision, is uh, when, when do you anticipate you will come up with, uh, lack of a better phrase, a regime to implement the decision? We're in discussions with the court and with opposing counsel. That depends right. on I mean, that depends on two people who are not us. Yeah. Okay. Um, let, let me go switch uh, areas here and go back to uh, um, aid to local law enforcement. 
um, if I may, and I realize, you know, we're bouncing you all over the place, and it's a big department, so maybe if you need to call on, you don't necessarily have to, but you need to call on staff for any of the detail here, I'd, I'd understand. I'm sorry? The, the, uh, the Violent Crime Task Forces, as DOJ is, currently uses that phrase, is a repackaging of the funding that used to go to state and local governments under the burn grants, the JAG grants, and the COPS programs. That was where the violent crime task forces were. That was where the, you know, the burn grants and the JAG grants were all. So you've repackaged um, uh, the funding to state and locals under those three um, programs. DOJ requested in the President's 2009 budget $200 million for violent crime task forces in this, and I'm not using the word repackaging in the value judgment, but reordering how, you've, how you help, uh, repackaging how you help local law enforcement. It requested in the 2009 budget $200 million for the violent crime task forces. And you also requested $200 million for another repackaging, which you call the Burn Public Safety and Protection um, uh, uh, Program. The bottom line is that direct support, as I read your budget, to state and local law enforcement is about $400 million under what used to be Burn, COPS, and JAG. Now, when, and I'm not, this is not just a little history here. When the administration came into office, the total amount of local support from the federal government to state and local law enforcement was about $2.1 billion. That was under the COPS program, the burn grants, and the JAG programs. Under the successor DOJ programs, you calling the violent crime task forces, and the burn public safety um, and protection uh, uh, rubric, the department has requested a total of $404 million this year. And that's an 81% cut under this administration. And it's a cut of less than that, but about uh, uh, $500 million just from your last year's budget. Last year, overall funding for state and local law enforcement was uh, for uh, $908 million for burn, JAG, and COPS. Now it is $404 million. Is that because you think, I mean, can you give me the reason why you have cut in half in a year the amount of local law enforcement funding that uh, is going, that you're proposing go to the states? Senator, your numbers, first of all, don't count grants for child safety and juvenile justice. They don't count grants for violence against women. Well, I didn't um, count those either. I didn't count those in the numbers. The $908 million did not include violence against women or juvenile justice funding. They've always been separate. They've been a separate account. They're not, they've never been part of BURN. They've never been part of JAG. They've never been part of the COPS program. I'm comparing apples and apples. What we found is that targeted grants that are targeted not only at particular areas where crime has spiked, but also at areas where we can focus our own activities in conjunction with state and locals are the most effective. And but that's the you, way but you need half as much money. Well, burn grants were targeted. The COPS program was targeted, as well as the JAG program was targeted. And last year, your targeting amounted to $908 million. This year, under a slightly different targeting system, you're $404 million. The COPS program was never meant to be a permanent support program. What it was meant to do was to give temporary grants to state and local authorities to enhance their police forces. Wrong. I wrote the COPS program with my own little paw. Well, the COPS program was intended to kickstart a community policing program nationwide, and the intention was, if it worked, it would be reauthorized, which it was on two occasions. 
the decision of this administration was to no longer reauthorize that program. I understand that. That's their judgment. But it wasn't, and look at the language when I wrote the bill and when it passed on the floor, that if it worked, which it did, the intention of the Congress was that it would be reauthorized. It was reauthorized twice. Um, I take, obviously, I take your correction, you wrote the legislation. My information was that that was supposed to attract um, further state and local funding for local police. It, it was. That had been in, that had been in, initially funded federally. It, it was. And then it was, if it worked, it would continue. Because, you know, that old expression Ronald Reagan used to worry, use, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. It wasn't broke. Violent crime came down under this act. I don't want to argue the COPS program per se. I'm trying to get at the rationale, and my time is up here, the rationale why in one year the targeted programs, however you characterize them, comparing apples and apples. Those programs targeted the violent crime task force stuff was done under the COPS bill. The JAG pro... Anyway, so why is there, why the cut in one year of about $500 million? The fact is that we've had a 1.7% reduction in violent crime. We've had a slightly two, more than 2% 2 reduction in property crime. We've had spikes in particular areas. We've tried to focus our activities in those particular areas where- So you just don't think that much is needed. Is that the down. honest answer? Um, we've tried to target the funds that we have. Well, fun, okay. Well, okay. There's still about 17,000 murders a year. Uh, you know, I find that, uh, you know, we have really dumbed down the definition of success. Crime is down. That's true. 1.6%, I think. But anyway, my time is up. I yield. Uh, uh, there's about 10 minutes left in the vote. So what I suggest is use the rest of the time adjourn. By that time, Senator Leahy will be back. There will uh, we may recess briefly. Yeah, you may have to recess to briefly, but it won't be, the chairman it won't be a minute or two, uh, General, if there was a, a hiatus here. I yield to my colleague. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Attorney General, I'd like to ask you, talk a little bit with you about executive orders. Um, executive orders very often govern particularly important matters uh, in my role on the Intelligence and Judiciary Committees. I've been obviously exposed to Executive Order 12333, which is the one that purported to protect Americans when they traveled overseas uh, from being wiretapped by their government. That one is about to be overtaken by the FISA bill that, whose vote uh, begins very shortly. Um, another one is 13440, which is the executive order that is intended to establish minimum standards for the appropriate and lawful treatment of alien detainees consistent with the Geneva Conventions. Um, this executive order has been criticized by the judge advocates general for all branches of the armed services, but it is the uh, executive order on which the administration relies in indicating that it has clear rules, I think is the administration's phrase, for detainee treatment uh, and the White House has said that interrogations must be done, quote, with safeguards and under the rule of law, which I view as uh, being in part this uh, executive order. Now, you and I have had an exchange about executive orders in your nomination. Uh, I indicated, uh, you indicated, uh, should an executive order apply to the president and he determines that the order should be modified, the appropriate course would be for him to issue a new order or amend the prior order. And I think that is an accurate statement. I, I happen to agree with that. What concerns me to take us back to our favorite place, OLC again, is that during the course of my review of the OLC opinions, I came across the following opinion of the Department of Justice by OLC. An executive order cannot limit a president. There is no constitutional requirement for a president to issue a new executive order whenever he wishes to depart from the terms of a previous executive order. Rather than violate an executive order, the president has instead modified or waived it. Is that rule still in force at the department? And if that is the case, can the president disregard executive order 13440 
governing the treatment of detainees without amendment or information to Congress or the American people? I think it's important or at least useful to analyze what the nature is of an executive order. An executive order is a direction by the President that the executive conduct itself in a certain way. Um, the President is free to change that order and his view of how the executive should behave. Anytime and he wants, and there's and a procedure for doing so. And direct it to behave differently. Yep. Um, the question are, is, can he leave an executive order in place and act in violation or derogation of it without ever going back and changing it just because he's the President? It's not a violation of it. Um, it is his order or an executive order to start with. I can imagine circumstances in which it would be not only possible but advisable for a president not to change an executive order when he finds out information that directs that the government should go in another direction. For example, if an executive order directed that a, a particular country be treated as not violative of certain norms and therefore eligible for certain privileges and he came by classified information that told him otherwise, he would be obligated, it seems to me, to reimpose those restrictions on that country. It would be inadvisable for him to file an amended executive order and put them on notice that he had come into possession of that classified information. Ever. Beg pardon? Ever. Let's say ever. Ever. Um, it would certainly be inadvisable. I mean, I can understand that there are timing time considerations that involved here. Something could happen rather suddenly and you don't if have there, to go through if the there process comes as well. Time, if there comes but a time that it's advisable and possible, then it's advisable and possible. It may never be possible. So I conclude from your answer that the existence of Executive Order 13440 can give us no assurance that the President is actually complying with it. I think the, the issue, the, the existence of Executive 4, 4, Order 440 suggests that the President is complying with suggests, it. Suggests, but can give us no assurance. The President is, has, having issued an order, um, is free to issue contrary directions. So the answer to my question is yes. It can give us no assurance that the President is following it. I think your question suggests an, a level of uncertainty that, with due respect, I think is unwarranted in the situation that you mentioned. Well, a lot of things that we were concerned were unwarranted appear to have become true, so here we are. But I think it's important to pin it down because the question of how we treat detainees is significant, and if 13440 doesn't, in fact, protect us, then it's important for us to know in Congress. It's one of the reasons I think the FISA statute is so important, is it repairs the limit of 1233. I would just note that uh, whether somebody's for or against the war in Iraq, I think we should all agree that the history of contractor abuse in Iraq has been a disgrace for this nation. We saw the degrading and inhumane techniques used by contract interrogators and detainees at Abu Ghraib prison, something that hurt us throughout the world. The unjustified killings of 17 unarmed civilians by contract security guards in Nisar Square in Baghdad. Sexual assault by contractors of U.S. women working in Iraq. This worries me a great deal, but I haven't found any of them held accountable under the law by the Justice Department. There's been 25 cases of detainee abuse in Iraq has been referred for prosecution. Justice Department has not brought charges in a single case. Ten months since the Nisha Square killings, no action, um, even though the FBI concluded the shootings were unjustified. Several women working in Iraq have testified before Congress that they were raped or assaulted by U.S. contractors, but nobody's done anything. And there have been no criminal prosecutions in U.S. courts from these cases from Iraq of Americans breaking the law. Why has the Justice Department not taken stronger action to hold contractors in Iraq accountable under U.S. law? I think the Justice Department has taken and is taking action with respect to contract anybody, abuse. Anybody America. been convicted? Um, can I get my notes? Sure. Thanks. Um, this is still the first vote, right? Yeah, this is still the first vote. Watching.
Is there any help? Right. I'm not aware of anybody who's been convicted. Um, it's my understanding that there have been 13 prosecutions and eight convictions. Um, that said, there have been Contract cases, abuses? Um, alleged crimes by employees of contract personnel in Iraq based on referrals from the Department of Defense or the Department of Safety. Can you give me a list of those? I will provide you with a list of those. Thank you. Um, as far as particular cases that you refer to, um, we generally do not acknowledge the existence of pending investigations, but we have acknowledged that the September 16, 2007 shooting in Easter Square is the subject of an, of an investigation. And you will let us know, though, of which ones have actually had convictions? Yes. Okay. Yes, I will. Um, and and I, I just want to point out one sorry. other thing, if I may. It is enormously difficult, um, particularly when we rely on initial investigations by the Department of State and by the Department of Defense, and we're, we have FBI agents trying to conduct investigations in a war zone um, to bring criminal prosecutions that pass the test sure. of an American court. Well, I, 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 I understand. It's, all, it's always difficult, but this country has always been able to do it. Uh, in fact, uh, Senator Grassley and I introduced a bill to extend the statute of limitations for criminal fraud in war zones like Iraq, something we've done in every other war. Do you support that bill? If, if statutes of limitations are what are, are what are interfering with our ability to bring prosecutable cases, I'm in favor of extending them. And um, again, we have brought successful prosecutions. Some cases involve allegations that don't wash out. There's nothing we can do. No, I understand that. Uh, we've uh, I spent enough years as a prosecutor to know not that every accusation is going to be a criminal matter, but we should. Uh, Expand the Military Extraterritorial Jurisdiction Act, MAJA. I hope you would support that. And, um, and I also wrote to you several months ago, here's something that can be done easily, with other senators about a Board of Immigration Appeals matter of AT. It's a woman seeking asylum in this country based on a fear of continuing persecution arising from the brutal practice of female genital mutilation, FGM. I thought we'd understood, had an understanding years ago in this country to stand the rights of human rights on this. I got your reply yesterday. The BIA denied the asylum seeker's claim, said she'd already been mutilated, so how could she be further persecuted? Now, that rationale has been criticized by the Second Circuit and others. You have the authority to overrule the Board of Immigration Appeals. Female genital mutilation is widely regarded as a serious human rights violation. Why not just use your authority and overrule them on this issue? Senator, that Most is, people can't understand what look, the that, that's, heck that, they were thinking. That's a ghastly practice. Um, that is an absolutely ghastly practice. I'm going to take a look at that case. Um, I can't promise you now that I'm going to certify it, um, but I'm going to take a look at that case. But um, you, could, you could, because of your authority, you could once and for all, make it very clear where we are in this, and I would urge you to. I, will, I, I promise you that I will consider it, and I promise you that I view that, Thank you. that practice as ghastly. And let me gonna, know. That that's going to inform that consideration. I almost hate to get into the question of Stephen Hatfield. I have refrained from discussing this. I refuse to discuss it with the press. I've told on some aspects of it I was aware of were classified, so of course I could not discuss it, but also considering the fact that my life was threatened by an anthrax letter, two people died who touched a letter addressed to me that I was supposed to open, I'm somewhat concerned. What happened? That case I mean, we're paying half of millions of dollars, uh, the indication being that the guy who committed the crime got went free. Well, um, I don't understand, quote, the guy who committed the crime, unquote, to have gone free. Um, what I do understand is that... Well, he has been, uh, nobody's been convicted. Not yet. And five people are dead. Yes. Uh, Hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent. That case is under active investigation, and I need to be very careful about what I say. Okay, we, won't, we won't go any further. As I say, I feel somewhat reluctance because I was one of the targets. But I got to tell you, what families of the people who died went through, the family of people that crippled went through, 
even what my family went through, a lot of people are concerned, and, and I, I won't say more because we are in an open session, but I think you and I should probably have a private talk about this sometime. Okay. That's fine. And I, um, we will adjourn with that. I've put my final statement in the record. I am concerned about the answers on waterboarding and secret memos when you say it's not necessarily before you now. I'm concerned that OLC opinions, whether you're relying on them today or not, are serve as precedent in the future. Um, you said when Senator Durbin and I asked you on January 30th, I think those opinions would be considered principally in light of whether they relate to things that are current or not, but I will review them. Today you said you have not and will not. I might hope you might reconsider that. Uh, you have I think one of the most important jobs in all of government. Uh, just because you're the one person, the one person who has the final say that the laws are going to apply to everybody in this nation. And I appreciate that you went from a very comfortable life to a round the clock life to do that. But this whole nation relies on it. It's not a Democratic or Republican issue. So I would hope that after the hearing today, if there are some things you may want to reconsider, please let us know. I understand that. And I want to tell you, as I told you yesterday, that I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here, notwithstanding that we might have some disagreements about something. It makes sure that I take the responsibilities that you eloquently described seriously and that it brings me up to the standard that I ought to adhere to or as close to it as I can get. And I Thank appreciate the, that chance. And I appreciate the private conversations you and I have had, and I appreciate your availability always to be there for those. Thank you. With that, we'll stand recess. Thanks.